This happened on a night just like every other. I was still just a kid and was just starting high school at the time. My parents had sent me to bed and then gone to bed themselves in their room on the other side of the house. Although I was supposed to be sleeping, I had a presentation due tomorrow and I needed to have the words memorized. Of course, being the kid I was, I wasn't fully prepared. I cared about my grades, as did my parents, but procrastination was something I struggled with. I sat in my bed reading the script over and over, trying my best to memorize the whole thing as fast as possible. After a while though, it was late and I knew I needed to sleep. I shoved my schoolwork off the bed and laid under the covers, closing my eyes. I felt confident in the first section of the presentation, but the last section I could barely remember and was worried about losing grasp of it overnight. So, as I laid there, I began reciting the words in my head, over and over the ending paragraphs of my presentation. I lost track of time, having not even opened my eyes once for what seemed like 20 or 30 minutes of reciting in my head. Now, feeling more confident in myself, I figured I was finally okay to go to sleep. I continued to lay in the same position for another few minutes before I was startled by a soft sound right in front of my bed by the closet. I opened my eyes quickly, looking straight down the edge of the bed. The room was pitch black, but in the darkness I could see a figure standing by my closet. I couldn't make out its features, but it was tall and standing still. Immediately at the sight of this, my heart started racing and I tried to scream as loud as I could, but my mouth wouldn't move. I tried to get up and run, but my body wouldn't move either. It was as if I could feel myself stuck on the inside of a shell, trying to push my way out but nothing was working. The more I tried to struggle inside, the more it felt like a large weight sat on my chest, making me struggle to even breathe as I couldn't open my mouth. The only thing I could do was look at this figure ahead of me. I was absolutely horrified, never having experienced anything like this before. I thought that maybe I was in a nightmare, but it was all too real. I knew I was not asleep. Then I began wondering if I was paralyzed. Would I be this way forever? But these thoughts were overrun by the immediate danger of the figure in front of me. After a minute of terrifying anxiety, the figure began to move, slowly walking to the end of my bed. As it approached, I could hear my heart beating rapidly and my blood pumping through me intensely. I tried everything to move and scream and run, but I was frozen. As it reached the bed, I still could not see its face. I could tell it was there, but it was like a dark shadow was casting over it, covering all of its features. I wanted to cry, or wake up, or anything to end this awful night. But after it stood there for another few seconds, it put its long arms on the bed and began crawling towards me. It slowly moved over my body, still with a shadow covering its face before stopping right above my head. My eyes wide open and with fear surging through me, a long second pass of total silence, before the figure quickly leaned its face directly in front of mine, screaming with its mouth wide open and staring into my eyes. Then in an instant, it vanished. Gone just like that. The screams, the figure, everything, all went silent and disappeared. As I laid there, shocked and terrorized, I felt my hand shaking. Then, as if it never even happened, I was able to move again. I leaned forward and looked around frantically, still unsure of the experience I just had. Being just a kid, I began wondering if demons were real and that's what I just saw. I wondered if what I had just experienced was actually there or if all of it was just a hallucination. When this happened, it was the late 1980s, so I couldn't just look it up and see what it was. Plus, I was too scared to tell anyone of it, thinking they may send me to some mental hospital or something. So, I went 15 years and not knowing what happened that night. It wasn't until I was driving home from work one day and had the radio on that I finally learned the truth. The host was talking about an experience he had on a podcast type show, and his description was disturbingly similar to mine. The radio show was still going on by the time I reached my home, 
so I stayed in my car while listening intently. He continued explaining his terrifying encounter until the very end when someone asked him what he thinks really happened. After a pause, he finally spoke the answer I'd been searching for all these years and said that it was something horrible and terrifying called sleep paralysis. I've been experiencing sleep paralysis ever since I could remember, since it happened so frequently. I thought it was normal and harmless, and my parents assured me the same. I never had any hallucinations or anything. I would simply just wake up randomly in the middle of the night and only be able to open my eyes and look around. It would always be a little freaky, as I want to pull the sheets over my head to hide, but was unable to. Anyway, there was a single experience that I had that really creeped me out, and I still think about it today. I was 11 at the time, and it was a school night after a nice weekend. At 9 o'clock, my parents made me get ready for bed and turned off all the lights as I got comfortable, holding my plushy doll between my arms. Then, just like any other night, I fell asleep. I never knew why my brain would wake me up at night, leaving me paralyzed and conscious. But as dumb as this may sound, the common reason seemed to be no reason at all. However, this night when I woke up, something felt different. I was more worried than usual, and only a few seconds after opening my eyes, I heard movement below me from downstairs. I had no way of seeing what time it was, but I knew my dad would stay up late sometimes, so I tried to calm myself. But the movement became more clear, revealing soft footsteps coming up the stairs very slowly. Even as a kid, I knew the difference between the sound of someone casually walking up the stairs and someone walking up quietly and carefully. I began to panic a bit more in my mind, though still trying to hush my thoughts as the footsteps approached my bedroom door and stopped. Now, my parents always warned me that hallucinations are a common side effect of sleep paralysis, and although I had never experienced them before, one day I was sure to. They described it as something like a nightmare that just feels real, but when it happens, I just have to keep telling myself that it isn't real and it will be over soon, just like any other dream. So, laying there immobile, I closed my eyes and repeated in my head that this was just a dream and nothing was real. After a minute went by, I opened my eyes again and felt a sense of relief as I was sure the nightmare had ended. That was, until my bedroom door slowly creaked open. I was practically holding my breath in fear as I watched what looked like a man walk into my room slowly. I closed my eyes again, hoping to get this awful nightmare to end. I listened as the soft footsteps on the wooden floors approached the side of my bed. I was too scared to even open my eyes and continued to repeat in my head that this was just a dream and I needed to wake up. I felt the man breathing on my shoulder as my doll was taken from my side. Then the footsteps faded away down the end of the room. I slightly opened my eyes, still horrified and got a glimpse of the man walking away with my doll and closing the door quietly. Even then, I still couldn't move. I just closed my eyes again and tried to control my emotions, but it was hard. Every awful thought I could think of was going through my head all at once. I don't even remember falling back asleep. When I woke in the morning, though, I was much more at ease. I sat up and looked around, making sure this wasn't some weird dream again. Everything seemed normal until I looked at my side. The doll wasn't there. All the emotions suddenly hit me again, and I began crying as I ran to my parents' room and woke them up. They didn't seem too surprised when I explained myself, having expected something like this to happen. My dad got up, though, and came to my room to help me look for my doll. He assumed I had just misplaced it, and it would turn up quickly like it usually does. But strangely, it didn't. Still not worried at all, my dad began searching the rest of the house. He knew how much the doll meant to me, and probably just wanted to make me feel better about my nightmare, but we still couldn't find it. In fact, we never did. I had never experienced sleep paralysis until a few months ago. I'd always felt lucky listening to other people's stories about it. It sounded horrifying, 
but my luck ran out apparently. I think it was because I was insanely stressed or anxious, as I'd only had it a few times after that, and then it stopped. The worst one, though, was the first time. I had fallen asleep pretty quickly, but I have a habit of waking up around the same time every night to go to the bathroom. Tonight was no different, except when I woke up. I was so tired I decided to hold it and just go back to bed. I was trying to fall back asleep when I realized I couldn't move. This has never happened before. So my heart started to race, and that's when I heard the door creak open. I was laying on my side with the blanket mostly on my face, so I couldn't see anything. I remember feeling so scared and frightened, and then I heard voices. Two male voices talking on the other side of my bed. I tried to yell for help from my roommate, but I couldn't. I couldn't speak at all. This made me even more anxious and my heart started pounding even harder. I felt like I couldn't breathe. These people that were in my room started moving to my side of the bed. I could hear them speaking to each other but couldn't understand what they were saying. I kept my eyes closed and hoped they thought I was asleep and would just take whatever they were here for and then leave. The only thought in my mind was that they were robbers. It all felt so real and I even wondered why my dog didn't bark, or how I didn't hear anything downstairs. I'm a light sleeper, after all. I kept my eyes shut and tried to remain calm, but one of them felt so close I could hear him breathing right next to me. He then whispered something, as if talking to me. I heard them walk away, and then the door slammed shut. I still couldn't move so I laid there until I fell asleep. What's even weirder is that night I had a dream that I got up after they left to check if they stole my money and they had. I dreamt that I woke my roommate up and told him everything. We checked the video cameras and saw two men go into my room and walk up to me. Then we went downstairs to ask our other roommates if they saw anything. But when we went down there, they were already on the phone with the police as our living room TV was gone and everything was a mess. I've never had such a vivid dream. And the fact that it picked up right where my sleep paralysis left off was even weirder. Obviously the next morning when I woke up I checked to see if everything was still there and it was. Nothing was on the video cameras but I swore that it felt so real and I was sure I was awake. It was the strangest experience of my life. After that night I had a few moments where I couldn't move or breathe and would hear the door open or the door of a different room close. I always sleep on my side so I've never actually seen any figures like a lot of other people do. That way, I'm lucky. But having auditory hallucinations at night is almost more horrifying as you can't look to see what's going on. You just have to listen and hope that whatever it is doesn't actually exist. Otherwise, you may not be as lucky as I was. I had never experienced sleep paralysis until a few months ago. I'd always felt lucky listening to other people's stories about it. It sounded horrifying, but my luck ran out apparently. I think it was because I was insanely stressed or anxious, as I'd only had it a few times after that and then it stopped. The worst one, though, was the first time. I had fallen asleep pretty quickly, but I have a habit of waking up around the same time every night to go to the bathroom. Tonight was no different, except when I woke up. I was so tired I decided to hold it and just go back to bed. I was trying to fall back asleep when I realized I couldn't move. This has never happened before. So my heart started to race, and that's when I heard the door creak open. I was laying on my side with the blanket mostly on my face, so I couldn't see anything. I remember feeling so scared and frightened, and then I heard voices. Two male voices talking on the other side of my bed. I tried to yell for help from my roommate, but I couldn't. I couldn't speak at all. This made me even more anxious and my heart started pounding even harder. I felt like I couldn't breathe. These people that were in my room started moving to my side of the bed. I could hear them speaking to each other but couldn't understand what they were saying. I kept my eyes closed and hoped they thought I was asleep and would just take whatever they were here for and then leave. The only thought in my mind was that they were robbers. It all felt so real, and I even wondered why my dog didn't bark, or how I didn't hear anything downstairs. I'm a light sleeper, after all. I kept my eyes shut 
and tried to remain calm, but one of them felt so close I could hear him breathing right next to me. He then whispered something, as if talking to me. I heard them walk away, and then the door slammed shut. I still couldn't move so I laid there until I fell asleep. What's even weirder is that night I had a dream that I got up after they left to check if they stole my money and they had. I dreamt that I woke my roommate up and told him everything. We checked the video cameras and saw two men go into my room and walk up to me. Then we went downstairs to ask our other roommates if they saw anything. But when we went down there, they were already on the phone with the police as our living room TV was gone and everything was a mess. I've never had such a vivid dream. And the fact that it picked up right where my sleep paralysis left off was even weirder. Obviously the next morning when I woke up I checked to see if everything was still there and it was. Nothing was on the video cameras but I swore that it felt so real and I was sure I was awake. It was the strangest experience of my life. After that night I had a few moments where I couldn't move or breathe and would hear the door open or the door of a different room close. I always sleep on my side so I've never actually seen any figures like a lot of other people do. That way, I'm lucky. But having auditory hallucinations at night is almost more horrifying as you can't look to see what's going on. You just have to listen and hope that whatever it is doesn't actually exist. Otherwise, you may not be as lucky as I was. It was a Monday night, a slower night for an Uber driver, especially in our bum-ass town. So when a trip request popped up on my screen, I jumped on it. I was picking up a guy named John. I drove across the neighborhood to a corner liquor store that was closed at this hour. There were two young guys waiting on the corner, and when I pulled up to the curb, they got in the car. I confirmed John's name to make sure he was who I was picking up. Then I started heading to their destination. The two whispered to each other, and it was a little odd. I looked at the rearview mirror every once in a while, and every time I did they would both notice and look back at me. I kept trying not to look, but I found myself accidentally doing it over and over. I asked them where they were headed. Neither of them answered. I figured they didn't hear me because the back window was open and there was wind noise. So I asked again. This time one of them yelled Harris Avenue. It didn't answer the main point of my question, which was to be polite and make small talk, but it did let me know these two were not exactly people I wanted in my car. I felt my big toe press a bit harder on the gas instinctively, just knowing I wanted to get there sooner. We got to the street, but the apparent address they wanted me to pull up to was some rundown storefront with a group of guys in front. I slowed down and asked if this was it. I turned around to face them, and saw they were both wearing masks now, similar to the masks from the movie The Purge. I felt something press up against the back of my shoulder. I assumed it was a gun. They told me pull up to where the guys were outside. I did so. Three big guys also wearing masks came up to my window, demanding my wallet. I gave it to them without hesitation, and the two guys in the back seat got out. The five masked men altogether walked away from my car, one of them kicking at my door while passing. I drove away and reported it to Uber, who said they'd get in contact with the authorities. It turned out the info used on that John Person's account was all fake, and he was using a stolen credit card. I lost $250, my IDs, and countless cards in my wallet, but I'm just happy I escaped with my life. After leaving a friend's Super Bowl party, I called an Uber to drive me home. When I got in the Uber, there was a guy in a baseball hat sitting in the back seat. I didn't say anything to acknowledge it, I just said hi to the driver. I figured I must have called an Uber pool instead of just a regular Uber. I didn't care though. We got to my house, I got out of the car, and shut the door. I heard a second door shut on the other side though. The car drove away. I saw the guy who had been sitting next to me in the baseball hat, standing in the street, facing in my direction, but his head down so that his hat was covering his face. I said, what's up, what's going on? He started to walk away. Still, I knew something was going on. So instead of walking to my house, 
I started walking around the block. I saw the man on the opposite sidewalk, across the street walking in my same direction. When there was an intersection in the street, I turned. When I saw he did the same thing, I ran. When I saw he started to run too, the adrenaline kicked in, and I sprinted faster than I'd ever ran in my life. I ran faster than him, and when I made it to my house, I ran to the backyard before he could possibly see where I went. Then I went into the house. I called the Uber driver at once, and he told me the guy next to me said he knew the next guy the Uber driver would be picking up, which ended up being me. The driver had his info, so he said he would report the guy. I don't know what happened because I had never called or texted the Uber driver again. I also don't know why exactly that guy would be targeting people getting out of Ubers, but it definitely taught me to be more cautious with Uber rides. What you're about to hear was the worst night of my life. I went out to a downtown club with my boyfriend and his friends on a Saturday night. My boyfriend and I hadn't been getting along for a while, and at some point in the club we had an argument. I didn't want to be there anymore, so I went outside and called an Uber to pick me up. It was raining that night, so I waited under the awning of a building nearby to the club. A white car pulled up in front of me and stopped. I walked over, and the woman driving rolled down the window. She said, Uber? And I said, yeah, and then her name. She said, yes. So I got in the back seat. I asked, how are you? And I'm pretty sure she didn't answer. When I didn't hear a response to my question, I shot a glance up from my phone for a second. The woman had both hands firmly planted on the steering wheel. She was driving in a very stiff, upright position. She also had very curly hair and a somewhat darker skin complexion. She was driving down the street I usually took to get home, only she was going the opposite way. I didn't want to speak up and correct her just yet, because maybe she was taking a different route. The further we went away from my house though, the more concerned and frustrated I got. Finally I spoke up and told her she was going the wrong way. She said in a horrible, thick accent, something about how she was going to the highway instead. I knew for a fact the highway wasn't the quicker route though. Then my phone vibrated, and I looked down to see the notification from Uber. It said on my screen, meet Uber driver now. I opened up the app, and it said my Uber had just arrived at the point I was originally standing at, and that the car I was supposed to get in was a black Nissan. At this point I started saying in a louder voice to the driver that she wasn't my Uber. I asked her to pull over and let me out. When she didn't seem to acknowledge me, I started to actually yell and push at her seat. Even though the car was moving, I even tried opening the door, but the child lock was A. After a little more yelling, she finally looked at me through the mirror, then pulled off to the side. The door clicked unlocked, and I got out of the car and walked away from it. My actual Uber driver was calling me, and I picked up, apologizing, asking him to come to my current location. He said he'd be right over, and five minutes later, the car pulled up. When I got in the car, I explained everything to him, and he stopped the car, looked at me, and told me I just escaped a sex trafficking trap. There had been reports of multiple fake Ubers going around trying to trick unsuspecting victims into getting into the car to lure them to unknown locations. It was apparently part of a sex trafficking ring, and the drivers were usually female to appear less intimidating to the female victims. I just want to stress to everyone, to make sure the car you're getting into is actually your Uber. One night when I was decently drunk after leaving a bar, I started messaging people on Tinder. Some girl named Alicia had messaged me, so I messaged her back. She answered almost immediately, asking what I was doing that night. I said I was just leaving a bar looking for someone to hang out with. She wrote back, you should come over and smoke. I said yes, send me her address. She sent back her address promptly. Seemed like the quickest, easiest, most ideal Tinder match a guy could ask for on a Saturday night. I called for an Uber to drop me off at that address. The driver pulled up in his Honda, and I got in the front seat. Usually I would get in the back seat, but I was decently drunk and feeling extra social. 
The driver seemed cool. I was honest with him about where I was going, telling him I was about to meet a girl from Tinder. He laughed and said nice. Started going on about his stories meeting girls as an Uber driver and such. On the way there I asked Alicia for her number, and she gave it to me. I started texting her, and she gave normal answers. When we got to the house, the driver said the house seemed familiar to him. Had to admit it did look a little sketchy since there were no cars in the driveway and the lights were off. He told me to be careful. I thanked him and said goodbye, and he drove away down the block and stopped near the end, I'm guessing setting up his next ride. I walked up to the house and tried to ring the bell, but I didn't hear a bell from the inside, so I knocked on the door. Then I tried calling Laisha. It went to voicemail after one ring, but she texted me right after saying it's open, come inside. Then there was a knock at the window, which almost gave me a heart attack. I looked at the window, and even though there were no lights on inside, I saw the blind was slightly lifted and someone was waving their hand on the other side of the window. Before I tried the door, a number not saved on my phone started calling me. I assumed it was Alicia, so I picked up. But instead of hearing the voice of a girl, I heard the familiar voice of my Uber driver. He ordered me in a very concerned voice to walk away from the house right now. I then saw the Uber driver's car pull back up in front of the house. He told me to get back in the car, up the phone and listen to him. As soon as I got in the car, he drove away from the house and told me that the house was vacant. In just the previous month, someone had been lured into that house, robbed and murdered. It was a story that likely could have been similar to my own had I stepped into that house. It was a lot for me to take in, but I thanked that Uber driver the best I could, and even took his number because he was so cool and I couldn't appreciate him enough. The next morning when I was sober, this was even more disturbing to think about. In the year 2014, I frequently used the app Uber because I wasn't able to drive for 12 months due to some DUI charges. Just a stupid mistake overall. There's this nightclub bar in my town that I would sometimes go to on the weekends with my friends. Sometimes I would get a ride home with a designated driver if we had one, and sometimes we would catch an Uber. This night I wasn't feeling too great, so I left a little early. It was somewhere between 1 and 2 in the morning. It was way too cold to walk home, so I called for an Uber. A guy nearby named Alex popped up, and I gotta be honest, he was a little creepy looking. He was older, didn't really smile in his picture, and he had a grayish goatee with a black beanie cap on. He was only two miles away, so I didn't really care. It said he had a Chevy Malibu, which sounded nice, so I requested he come pick me up. I waited on the bench outside the club next to the bouncer, who stood still like a statue, hands folded together. About five minutes later, a silver 2003 or something Chevy Malibu pulled up in front of the club. I stood up, a bit disappointed. It was such an old ratty looking car. The guy didn't call me over or honk or anything, he just waited by the curb. So I got up and entered the back seat of the car. Right away things got uncomfortable. He didn't say hello, he didn't shake my hand, he didn't even turn his head to look at me. All he said was in a very quiet voice, to which I replied with my address. We began moving down Main Street, but in the wrong direction of my house. I told him this, and he turned left at the next intersection. Now we were moving away from the main roads and down the quieter residential areas. He didn't put my address into his phone, so I felt really strange. I didn't know if he was expecting me to direct him or not. I ended up putting my address into my own phone so he could listen. When the GPS said turn left down the next street, he completely missed it. I made a confused hand gesture. He noticed it and said, I just gotta make a quick stop, don't worry, I'll give you a discount. Even though I was drunk, I still knew something bad was going on. Then that's when I noticed the handgun sticking out from his middle glove box next to him. By now I was trying to figure out how to get out of this car. At the next red light, I tried the door handle very quietly, but it wouldn't open. I saw that the child lock was on, 
and from this point forward my heart was racing. The man was driving us far out of the direction of my house. We must have been two towns over by now. I was getting desperate. I couldn't call the cops because I didn't know what this guy might do. I figured my best option would be attempting to flick the child lock, switch next to him by the front seats. I had to somehow slide over to the opposite side of the back seat behind him without him noticing. This was one of the most tense moments of my life. I locked my sight on his head through the rearview mirror, making sure he wasn't looking. I very casually slid behind him, thankfully he didn't notice. Now came the scariest part. I had to reach for the button up front at the next red light before he could do anything. Each light we passed I felt more and more tension build up as I was waiting, waiting for one of them to turn yellow, and eventually one finally did. He slowed the car at an intersection that would usually be busy during daylight hours. It was a perfect escape point. The car came to a stop. I knew this light wasn't very long, so I had to be quick. A car was stopped at the opposite side of the intersection, which made me feel a little better. With all of my courage, I reached my hand up to the lit up child lock button, and I must have startled him because he jumped two inches out from his seat. He screamed at me, and as I feared he would, he went for the gun right next to him. I was able to open the door and flee to the nearby Cadillac Escalade where I banged on their windows asking for help. They drove off completely avoiding me, but it didn't matter because the man in his Chevy Malibu was already gone down the block. I ran into a nearby grocery store that was open 24 hours, where I called a taxi this time. This was a very sobering experience because I don't remember being drunk at all in that store or during the taxi ride home. I reported the driver to Uber who said they would escalate the situation to the authorities. It wasn't until a whole week later that an officer finally showed up at my front door for some questioning, and that was the end of that. I have no idea what became of that guy, but I've never used an Uber since. When I was 14 years old, I lived with my mom, dad, two brothers, and my sister in a rural town in Florida. Overall, I miss living in Florida, but the one thing I don't miss was the constant rain. On one particular stormy Saturday night, where the thunder was so loud it shook the whole house. Me and my two brothers had nothing to do. My sister was out at a friend's house. Me and my two brothers decided to play some video games to pass the time. It was only 8 o'clock, after all. I remember we were playing some weird PS2 game where all the WWE wrestlers were driving cars and shooting at each other. I don't remember the name, but I remember the exact moment the power went out. I was about to kill my brother in the game when the room went completely dark and the sound of something popping from outside echoed into the room. We assumed a fuse had blown outside on one of the power lines. We went a call for our dad, who was already getting his rain jacket on to go outside and check. Our house has two fuse boxes, one outside attached to the telephone pole on our lawn and one inside. He asked me to go outside with him to aim a flashlight at the fuse box. When we were outside, he opened up the fuse box and began flicking around the different switches, hoping to reset something. He tried every switch, but the power didn't seem to come back on. He told me to wait there and to keep flicking switches while he went inside to do the same thing with the indoor fuse box. The rain was coming down hard. I just wanted to go inside as soon as possible. As I had the flashlight in my hand aimed into the fuse box, even through the sound of rain pounding down on the ground, I thought I heard something come from the woods behind our house, like a giant log cracking. I aimed the flashlight into the woods, and for maybe half a second, I thought I saw an arm reaching around from behind a tree. But as soon as the light exposed it, the arm pulled away behind the tree. I shut the fuse box, ran up the front patio, and into the house. I ran to my dad, who was tampering with the switches inside the fuse box in the closet. He entertained my claim, but he didn't seem to take what I said very seriously. He followed me outside around back, where I aimed the flashlight into the woods. The same spot I saw the arm. My dad took the flashlight from me and made his way into the woods. I stayed by the back patio in total darkness. 
Pretty soon my dad went so deep into the woods that I couldn't see the flashlight anymore. Growing nervous, I inched my way closer to the woods, repeatedly calling out for my dad, until I found myself walking into the woods. It was hard to even hear myself think over the sound of rain pouring down on the leaves above, but I did suddenly hear footsteps not too far away. Once again, I called out for my dad, and I heard him answer. This made me panic. Why, you may be wondering. Because my dad's voice came from a completely different direction than the footsteps. I ran in the direction of my dad's voice and eventually found him walking back to the house. Out of breath, I barely managed to tell him about the footsteps over in the other direction. He told me to go back inside, and he'll continue to look around, and so I went inside and locked the door. Me, my brothers, and my mom all waited by the back door, expecting to see him come out of the woods any second. Eventually, we heard someone at the front door trying to open the locked door. I went over, expecting it to be my dad, but my mom stopped me and looked through the peephole. Then she screamed. She ushered me away from the door and told all of us to go upstairs, and at that same moment my dad came back into the house through the back door. I didn't see the rest of what happened, but I heard my dad yelling at someone outside. When he came back in, he told all of us he saw someone running into the woods. I knew he was taking this seriously now. We thought it would end there, but the next morning, we found that the basement window had been smashed, and there were muddy footprints all over the basement carpet. A large wad of cash that was sitting on the basement bar was stolen, along with a few antique decorations that held some value. The scary part was that the muddy footsteps went up the stairs, but stopped there. Our basement door had a very heavy-duty lock, which may be the only thing that stopped this man from exploring the rest of our house, possibly even our bedrooms. It's been a pretty rough couple of nights over here in Midwest. Flood warnings are replaced with thunderstorm watches, Thunderstorm watches are followed up by tornado warnings, and even sirens add a nice touch to this surreal nightly experience. I used to enjoy a good thunderstorm. You get yourself comfortable on a couch, grab an extra pillow with a blanket, cuddle up and enjoy the show of grace and might. Lightning bolts ripping through the sky, illuminating clouds, houses and tree lines. The sound wave, coming with a tad of delay, shaking the window frames and sending a strange tangle through your body. Nature is a powerful force, and it was majestic to see it in action. Until tonight, the forecast was promising a late-night thunderstorm, so I was caught by surprise when I started seeing flashes outside around midnight. Since I wasn't prepared for it, I tried to quickly finish up the orange as the new black episode and get myself to the couch. When I got my headphones off, I realized why the flashes seemed so odd at first. There was no sound to follow them. I mean, if the lightning is in the clouds or pretty far away, then yeah, I guess the sound could be missing. But the flashes seemed so close. I decided to check out the sky of the kitchen window. There's a pair of large glass panels that give you a good wide-angle view to the outside. To keep my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I stayed away from flipping the switches on and traveled through the house relying on my memory. The moonless darkness of outside gives you that eerie feeling, even if you are inside of the safe walls of your house. But those are just the feelings, nothing else. If it wasn't for the glass, the pitch black darkness of both sides made me feel like the safe walls surrounding me no longer exist, and that feel of safety was slowly crawling away. But the walls did shatter when I glanced up high into the sky, and my eyes met the twinkly stars staring back at me. There were no clouds. There was no thunderstorm with lightning. No, there wasn't. But the next flash right from the other side of the window pane did reveal that there was someone five feet away from me, and nothing but a thin glass sheet was separating us apart. In the year 2009, I was spending a weekend with my uncle on his ranch when my parents were renovating the new house we had just bought. It was my second night there, 
a Saturday, and it happened to be during one of the biggest thunderstorms of the year. I'd say there were at least three crashes of thunder and lightning per minute. And we were in the heart of the storm, because the thunder would crash not even a second after the lightning would. I always enjoyed listening to storms while laying in bed, so I stayed up a little later watching TV, just enjoying the ambience. After the movie I was watching finally ended, I turned off the TV and tried to fall asleep. As I heard the lightning strike from outside, I could have sworn I heard some kind of metallic thud coming from outside at the same time. I didn't pay it too much mind. 20 seconds later, I could have sworn I heard it again. A very distinct metallic thud coming from outside to match the timing of the lightning. I really don't mean to make this sound like a cliche horror story, but my uncle really is a kind of creepy guy and I was never close with him, even remotely. So for that reason, I didn't feel right going to wake him up. I just tried to forget about it. Now I was getting concerned. What the hell could that be? After the third time, I finally got out of bed and walked over to the window of the guest bedroom. The water pouring down on the window made it extra hard to see what was out there in the dark fields. A flash of lightning momentarily lit up the property, but I couldn't see anything. However, once again, the sound of a metal hit accompanied it. The sound was so close now, it sounded like it was coming from the left of the window at a blind spot. I was going to do something I knew my uncle wouldn't be happy about. It would be a bit messy, but I was going to open the window and peer outside to see if I could see what the sound was. I unhooked the window lock and slid it up, and immediately the wind of the storm blew drops of rain into the room and onto me. I stuck my head out the window and looked to the left, and at that very moment, lightning lit up the property once again, and I could see a person dressed in all black, crouched down by the outside basement door with his hand raised in the air, and before the sky went dark, I caught the briefest glimpse of what the sound was coming from. The person was bashing at the basement door lock. I pulled my head in and quietly shut the window, making sure to lock it. I was in a panic. I feared he might have seen or heard me. I ran back to bed and pretended to be asleep, facing away from the window. Lightning crashed once again, but this time there was no metallic thud. My heart must have dropped as I realized this. I just stayed put in bed for the longest time, hoping whoever was out there would go away. After maybe three more lightning crashes without any thuds accompanying them, I thought it would be safe to go tell my uncle. I turned to face the window and screamed. There was a figure, clear as day, standing at the window, looking in at me. I screamed as loud as I could and ran straight to my uncle's room. He went outside with his hunting rifle, with nothing on but his pajamas, not even socks. He ran around the entire property yelling like a madman, but didn't find anyone. The next morning we were able to better see the marks on the basement door lock. It was almost bashed open, maybe three or four more good hits would have done it, according to my uncle. He was proud of me for picking up on it. Luckily I was out of there that same day. My uncle hasn't told us of any incidents since, so I think he's been okay. Not that we talked to him much at all. I'm grateful I stayed up a little later that night watching that movie, because I may have just stopped a robbery, or possibly much worse. All my life, I'll never forget this experience. I've always had a close group of friends who I could relate to, and that we all loved baseball. Six of us were on the same team in a league, while all eight of us consistently played pickup baseball with each other. We lived in the country, and there was this really low-key, convenient little clearing in the woods which had a baseball field and a basketball court. I shit you not, it was almost like our own little private park. Nobody else was ever there. Mostly because nobody knew about it. It was off some dead-end dirt road with nothing on it, and it was surrounded by nothing but forest. We were all 11 or 12 years old at the time. And living in the country, you tend to have parents who are a little more lenient with letting you out unsupervised. At least that's how it was for us. This field was about a quarter mile away from my house, 
so I always walked with my baseball bag containing my bat, glove, and a few extra balls. This was the day. The day that ruined it for our whole group in this park. It was a Friday night, middle of July. So the sky was turning that deep orange as the sun was setting. That meant our game had to be wrapping up soon. I was coincidentally up at bat when two of my friends who were out at field pointed to something. We all turned and saw a huge group of men entering the little clearing and sitting down on a nearby bench. There were six men. I guess thinking back now, I'd say they were in their 20s or 30s at the time. I wouldn't say that they had a gang-like appearance, but they sure didn't look like guys you'd want to run into in a dark alley. The disturbing part was that they all either sat or stood there just watching our group playing baseball, and I could see and hear them laughing and making a lot of noise. We all looked at each other and kind of mutually agreed to pack up, since it was getting late anyway. As we all started putting our stuff in our bags, they all started calling out, I don't leave. As we all high-fived each other saying our goodbyes, we looked back at the bench and we got scared when we saw all six men were now standing up, still watching us. You may think this sounds dumb, how a group of eight kids would get scared because some people entered a park, but you don't understand the way they were intently staring at us. Now here was the bad part. I usually tended to walk alone since my house was in a different direction of everyone else. I asked my friend Jordan to kind of escort me out of the clearing into the dirt path that I walked on just so it wouldn't be so obvious that I'm walking alone. Then I gave him a high five and we went our separate ways. It was getting really dark now, in the woods especially. That's why I always kept a flashlight in my baseball bag. Every click and every snap in the woods made me shine my light over in paranoia. My heart was actually racing. I just wanted to get home safely and get to my nice warm bed. Each step in the dirt seemed to become louder and louder as I became more sensitive to the sounds around me. I felt sweat dripping down my cheek as I heard laughter and screaming in the near distance. Not of my friends, but of grown men. Picked up the pace, thus causing a few of the spare baseballs to fall out of my bag, which I had apparently forgotten to zip up. I sighed an annoyed breath, dropped the bag, and hurriedly looked for the balls with my flashlight. The subsequent snapping of leaves and twigs from behind me made my heart drop. I turned and shined my light to reveal a tall man in a black, hooded sweatshirt, with the hood covering his face inching his way closer to me. Only after I revealed him in the light, he wasn't inching anymore. He was full-on running toward me. I felt life almost escape me as I ran for my life, dropping the flashlight and leaving all my baseball gear behind. I could hear my chaser behind me all the way until I saw the light from my house. I screamed for my mom and dad, and that's when I heard my chaser turn around. My mom and dad were hysterical in reaction to what I told them, and called all seven of my friend's parents asking if their kids were alright and explaining the situation. Thankfully all of my friends made it home okay that night, though my friend Jordan was actually followed briefly as well. He told me he wasn't chased after he started running though. After this incident, all of our parents stopped allowing us to go to that field. We still live in the same house, and it still makes me a bit uncomfortable, knowing that one of those men, therefore all of them, know where I live. I used to play basketball back in high school. I was never really too good or anything. I just played so I could say I played a sport and to put something on my college resume. This one particular game, we were playing some nearby school. I can't remember the name of it, but we were home. This wasn't a very important game, so not a lot of people were watching the bleachers. I think we were down like 22 to 13, when some kid on the other team started trash talking me and a few of my teammates, but mostly me making fun of my size and my hair. It got to the point where after every shot I missed, the kid would throw some wise as comment my way. Eventually I couldn't take it anymore and I shoved the kid as hard as I could. He fell on his back, sliding off the court. My teammates held his teammates back from attacking me as the ref blew his whistle and ejected me from the game. I didn't care, it felt way too good to feel bad about it. I walked right past my coach, not even batting an eye, 
and went straight for the locker room. The door was locked for some reason. I didn't want to have to awkwardly ask my coach to go unlock it. So I went outside and went around to the other side of the boys' locker room, where there was an outside entrance. Strangely, that one was open. That door was never left open. As I stepped into the locker room, I realized it was as cold in there as it was outside. The door must have been open all game. The lights also weren't on, and I didn't have my phone on me so I couldn't use the flashlight or anything. I shut the back entrance door and began feeling around the walls like a blind person looking for the light switch. Over the sound of my skin rubbing against the brick wall, I heard a locker click, the sound of one of the lockers closing. I confidently called out, who's there? Assuming it was one of my teammates. No reply. It was dark in there, but not the kind of dark where you can't see anything. I began a slow walk down past the aisles, scanning each one for anybody who could have made that sound, and all the while I heard footsteps in the room, so I knew I wasn't alone. I got to the last aisle, and saw for a mere second at the opposite side of the aisle, someone really big moving behind the lockers as if they were hiding. I felt my heart skip a beat, and was officially freaked out. So I decided to just leave and wait for the game to end to get my stuff. I made my way to the main entrance and tried to pull the door open, but it was locked from the inside too. I found the light switch right next to the door though, and the return of light made me feel a little better. With the light on, I gained the confidence to just confront whoever was in the locker room. Again, I started doing laps around the locker aisles, but I didn't see anyone. However, I still heard the footsteps opposite me wherever I went. If I was in one aisle, I heard the footsteps exactly opposite me in the next aisle over. I continuously called out, who's there? I never even got so much as a cough in response. I became almost out of breath walking and running around the aisles so much. I then looked at the lockers and realized that in between them were tiny holes in which you could see over to the next aisle. Had an idea. I could peek through one of those holes and see who was on the other side, and so I quietly got on my knees and put my eye up to one of the holes. At first all I thought I saw on the other side was darkness, as if something were blocking it, but I quickly realized what it was. What I was looking at through that hole was an eye. I ran out that back door quicker than I'd ever run in any of my games. When I went up to my coach, who understandably looked annoyed at me, I told him there was someone in the locker room. At first he assumed it was just the janitor, but after I convinced him it wasn't, he looked at me with a look on his face that told me he believed me. After the next call, he told the refs to pause the game that there might be an intruder in the locker room. Half of my team and the coach went in to investigate, but by that time whoever was in there was gone. I didn't feel stupid or anything, as everyone seemed to believe me. I mean the room was freezing and the back door was still open for crying out loud. What we did find out at the end of the game, however, was that four of my teammates were missing their clothes from their lockers. All of them from the freshman locker aisle. I think I figured out what kind of person I was in that locker room with, and I'm just happy I never caught him. My brother is a hockey player but he's only 13 years old, so I have to drive him to his games and practices a lot. His team always plays in an outdoor rink, so it usually gets really cold out. A couple weeks ago, I took my brother to his game, and since I usually get bored when I stay at his games, I took my girlfriend Michelle to watch with me. My brother's team was down like 4-0 to zero by the end of the first period, and we really weren't enjoying it anymore. So me and Michelle decided to, uh, to go to a more private location, not for anything sexual, just to smoke the stuff we brought with us. She's not a big smoker, but I'm usually able to convince her to light up with me. The park that this rink is in is very foresty. About half of it is nothing but dense forest. Locals call it the burning woods for obvious reasons. Me and Michelle found a good spot behind a few big trees, and a few moments later, after lighting the ball, we heard footsteps approaching us. I put the lighter and pipe away quicker than I even had time to think about it. Ha ha ha. 
We heard a chuckle as two guys lower to mid-twenties came into light. One of them had a painfully cliched mohawk with a green stripe and black fuzzy hair beneath. The other a big bald guy with a goatee. The guy with the mohawk laughed and said, It's cool, don't worry about it. You got enough for two more? My first instinct was to say piss off. I'm spending time with my girlfriend. But for some reason the words that came out were, Yeah, I think so. I'm a serious coward. I always think of appropriate things to say in my head, but I never gather the courage to actually say it. After I said yeah, he told me he was just kidding, but that he had some super dope Durban poison or something in his car if we were interested. I looked at Michelle, who shrugged her shoulders, but I knew deep down she didn't want to go with them, just like I didn't. I then looked in the direction of the hockey game. I told them, nah, it's okay. We were just finishing up anyway. The guy just nodded his head and said, Oh. He stuck out his hand for a goodbye high five slash handshake, and I shook his hand. I directed Michelle back in the direction of the hockey rink. We both agreed that those guys were weird. We stopped when we thought they were far away. It's not like there wasn't any point in not smoking just because of that encounter. I gave Michelle the pipe and lighter, and as she flicked it, I could swear I heard footsteps moving through the leaves again. I did a quick side glance about 2 o'clock, and I knew he was there. The guy with the green mohawk. He was standing behind a tree with his head, just kind of peering out from it. I did that thing with my eyes looking over in that direction to kind of hint at it to Michelle. I didn't want to confront the guy because at this point I knew something was wrong with these guys. And as I was already having no part of this, we both heard a stick snap from right behind the tree we were standing by. I pulled Michelle with me as we walked back closer to the hockey rink and back into the light. At this point I lost interest in smoking. I just wanted to go back to the safety of the bleachers. We made it past the tree line and back onto the path. When we heard one of the guys call out, Hey, how about me? We turned around, and there they were. The two guys standing by the edge of the tree line maybe 20 feet away from us with haunting smiles on their faces. And then I looked past them and saw a third guy behind them, half covered by a tree. No, it's okay guys. Thanks. I yelled back. Those words hit me like a bullet. I dared not turn around. I simply nudged Michelle forward even faster to the bleachers that were now only about 50 feet away. I feared if I turned around I'd see a gun or something in his hands. We made it back safely to the bleachers with the feeling of comfort being around other people. The game ended and my brother's team lost 9-5. to five. My brother stayed after a bit to speak with his coach, who was offering him a position on his other team. And by the time he was done, just about everyone had already left. With three cars in the parking lot, we all got into my truck and went home. But on the way out of the parking lot, I noticed immediately that the car behind us was tailgating and then shortly after started honking. I knew it was them. It had to be. They must have waited for us in their car. Why were they targeting us specifically? We didn't do anything. By a lucky break though, we didn't even have to drive all the way down the streets. Parked on the corner of a side road, seemingly waiting to give tickets to unsuspecting drivers, was a Ford Explorer police car. We pulled up next to it, and the car behind us kept driving past. The cop rolled down his window, and we pointed at the car, telling him that those guys were harassing us. All the cop did was nod his head and say okay, before rolling up his window. I took that Azure Q to drive away, but I drove slowly hoping to see his car turn on along with his lights. They didn't. For whatever reason, he didn't care to chase them down. Two weeks later, it still bothers me every day, and this whole situation still scares me every day. My name is Aiden. I live in rural Vermont with my parents and two brothers. One weekend, when my parents were gone, my grandma had us take a little trip over to her house for the weekend. She has money, so she lives on a nice big private property, and she has things for us to do there. It was the closest thing to a vacation that we'd get all summer. I'm the oldest and I was 15 at the time, 
so I guess my parents still didn't fully trust us to be left home alone at that time. Me and my younger brother were playing basketball out front until the sun was just starting to set. After that we went inside and ate dinner. My grandma later called me down from my room because we left the door to the Morton building open. That confused me because we didn't even go into the Morton building. I went downstairs to the dining room window where I could see that the door was in fact open. It was dark out there now, but the light above the door was on and made it easy to see the opening. I called up to my two brothers, who both claimed they didn't open it. I expressed concern to my grandma, suggesting maybe somebody had broken in. She overreacted, as she does with everything. I went to the front door and looked out the glass up top and literally screamed, holy shit, my grandma yelled, what's wrong, and started freaking out. I told her I saw a man just standing at the bottom step of the front porch. She came over to look for herself and then started yelling to call the cops. I told her I'm going to go outside and confront him, but she literally would not let me. She would cry and beg me not to open the door and even tugged at my arm each time I tried to grab the doorknob. I finally agreed to call the cops instead and waited out. My grandma got on the phone, almost crying to the operator, kind of overreacting by stating that somebody is going to break into our house. I sat in the dining room looking out the window, watching the man. My grandma wouldn't allow my two younger brothers to even come downstairs. The blackness of the man's figure standing out there was the only thing darker than the surrounding ambience. Finally, the man turned and walked past the window I was sitting by, seemingly circling to the back of the house. We tried to follow through the house, watching him through every window possible, until we lost him completely. We were in the den of the house, looking through the back window, but he was nowhere in sight. We had nothing to tell the police when they arrived other than someone was standing at our front porch. They apparently had been in our Morton building, and they walked around back near the trees and disappeared. Nothing unusual was found in the Morton building, and they couldn't find the man anywhere on the property. They told us to call them back if we see them again, because realistically there was nothing they could do. My grandma insisted we stay upstairs, and she would sleep down there for the night. Me and my brothers were playing on the GameCube that we brought along upstairs at around 10 o'clock, when we heard my grandmother's heart-chilling scream coming from downstairs. We all panicked and sprinted all the way down to the den where we saw our grandma pointing into the pitch-black office. She said there was someone in there. I closed the door and told my brothers to help me lean up against it while grandma once again called the cops. The cops arrived and to our surprise found the man laying on her grandma's office couch. He was very open about his intentions, spending the night in the warmth of the house. There were two windows that you couldn't exit from in that office, meaning the door we were blocking was the only exit. He admitted he simply entered the house through the den window which was not locked. My grandma is 92 now. She's always been a skittish, worrisome little thing. But this event only made her that much more paranoid with just about everything. I was vacationing in the Bahamas when I was 14 with some family friends. My friend and I were getting some henna tattoos at the hotel, and there was this guy lingering around us, but we didn't think much of it because a lot of people would stop to see what was going on. After mine was done, I told my friend and her mom I was going to go back to the room to get ready for dinner. There were two ways to the other side of the hotel, either inside through a bunch of small stores or outside along the pool. I walked through the inside and got to the elevator, where I saw the guy who had been watching us already at the elevator. We got on together, and he gestured for me to choose my floor button first. I clicked it, but he didn't choose another floor. Alarms start going off in my head, but what could I do? I was stuck in an elevator. The elevator stopped on my floor, and I started walking to my room. In this hotel, most of the rooms faced the ocean. So to the right in this hallway were just windows. I was in the very last room on that floor, and I could see the guy following me about 10 feet behind. About two doors from my room, he ran up and grabbed me. I kicked and screamed, and he dropped onto the floor. I ran to the room and locked myself in. 
After talking with security and giving a description, they found the guy and found out that he had actually been following multiple younger women in the building. It was a few weeks ago. I took a trip with my wife Allison to a top of the mountains resort a few hours from our house. Out of respect for the family run resort, I won't be mentioning the name. It was a couple's weekend, so the itinerary would be heavily catered to adults rather than its usual family orientation. The resort had a very old-fashioned country-ish feel to it. Everything was built from wood. Our room was huge. It was actually two rooms combined to one, with the door that usually separates the two having been left open. The first night was actually a singles mingle night in the basement club just below the dining hall, even though it was meant to be a couple's weekend. So we just played some late night shuffleboarding, conversed with a few other young couples, and drank at the bar for a bit while listening to an amateur musician playing guitar up on the stage. When we got back to our room at around 12.30, there was a rather disgusting smell. A new smell that wasn't there earlier. It smelled kind of skunky. Allison kind of playfully smacked my chest and accused me of smoking pot. However, I assured her I haven't even done so since I was in college. Allison went to the front desk in the main building and requested a different room. They denied the request as most of the rooms were booked, but they did send someone up to our room who agreed it smelled funky in there. The smell was mostly coming from the attached extra room that we weren't sleeping in. He offered us a partial discount to our bill for the inconvenience and sprayed some of the breeze from the closet around the room. We took his suggestion to keep the door separating the two rooms closed as his skunk might have gotten into the other room. We went to sleep shortly after, or at least tried to, as a few minutes after turning out the lights. Me and Allison both heard a consistent thud-like sound every few seconds coming from the left of the bed in an adjacent room. I tried to ignore it and just wait it out, hoping it would stop, but it just became too annoying. I was sure it was some kind of rodent making the noise in the next room over. I took a broom as a weapon and went into the connected room. I checked in the closet and under the bed. Nothing. The sound had stopped as well. I was heading back to our main room when I noticed something in the corner. I didn't turn my head fully in fear of what I knew I was going to see. But through my peripheral vision, I saw a very tall, black figure-type object in the corner of the room. After locking the door connecting the two rooms, we once again phoned the front desk, and they immediately sent the owner of the resort up with a gun. The door to the hallway on the other side of the room was open, meaning the thing I saw in the corner was a person, and they made a break for it as soon as I left the room. The owner actually told us that we were smart to call as there had actually been some creeps coming to the resort, stealing food from the cafeteria, and sneaking into people's rooms at night. My dad has been an MTA transit subway station manager for 35 years. With this job, there has to be a manager on duty at all times, so he's practically done every single possible shift throughout his career. That means he's done his fair share of night shifts. Most trains were completely empty throughout the night. He said it was the only nice part about doing the night shift. He has a series of funny and weird night shift stories to tell. But there's one downright horrifying one. My dad had just boarded the train to move to his office at another station. He was alone when he got on, which was at about 3 in the morning. At the next station, someone boarded. My dad describes him as a white, tall, and skinny man wearing a heavy jacket and beanie. He shot my dad a quick glance before sitting in the furthest corner away from him. My dad said that he felt uncomfortable as the guy kept looking up at him every so often. When my dad's stop came, he got off, as well as the other man. He walked to his office door, unlocked it, and looked behind him. The man in the jacket was pacing around only about 50 feet away. My dad stepped into his office, shut the door, locked it, and sat at his desk. Five minutes later, someone started to try and turn the doorknob. After the person on the other side of the door realized it was locked, they started to knock softly. My dad called out, Who is it? And they responded, I want to talk. 
He told whoever it was to go away. He says he knew trouble when he saw it. He had a good feeling it was the guy from the train, as this station at a time like this was apparently always completely empty. My dad told the guy to go away. He continued to knock for a good five minutes. My dad finally pulled up the security camera screens and brought up the camera pointed to his office door. Sure enough, there was the guy from the train, wearing the jacket and beanie. Coincidentally, as soon as my dad brought up the camera, the man walked away. So my dad did whatever his work consisted of for about half an hour in that office. Before leaving to catch the next train, he checked the camera to make sure that the weird guy wasn't out there. He locked up and walked down the stairs to the train platform, where he got on the train right away. He saw the guy from before walking down the stairs to the platform and then stepping on the train into the same car as my dad. He sat down on the opposite side, a few seats to the right. My dad tried to look away and pretend not to notice him, but he knew the guy was staring at him. He at one point gave in and stared back, giving a slight nod and smile and some sort of truce attempt before looking away again. The man stared at my dad the whole ride to the next station, but my dad never looked back at him once after the first time. Now you may be asking, why didn't he try to forcibly get the guy to back off? Well, despite my dad's intimidating size, he's always been a complete teddy bear. No bark and no bite. Plus, he says he feared that guy was armed, and that one small motion could lead to death. When the train stopped at the station, my dad practically ran all the way back up to the streets, constantly glancing over his shoulder. And yes, the man from the train was following him. My dad had to find the first public building still open to try and escape. He found a Wendy's that was open and stepped inside. He sat and watched as the guy following him walked up to the window, stopped, and stared my dad down through the glass for about 10 seconds before turning around and walking across the street and then down the sidewalks. My dad said he ate, waited a little longer, then left the Wendy's to get to his third and final station for the night. The scariest part, when my dad was in his third office, as he was checking the security cameras out of the paranoia of the situation, he caught the guy from the train pacing around the outside, only about 30 feet from his office. He then stopped, looked up at the camera, and according to my dad, literally froze and stared for no less than a minute. When he finally lowered his head, he walked away out of the station to never be seen by my dad again. My dad doesn't know if he was followed after leaving the Wendy's, but that would only make sense. The guy was clearly disturbed, possibly homeless and or dangerous, and who knows what he actually wanted with my dad. Me and my three friends were in New York around Christmas time. We didn't finally decide to leave until about maybe two in the morning. We got on the first train that we could catch, and as expected, it was empty. We were pretty sobered up by then. Then there was a sudden commotion in the next car over. We had peeked through the glass in between the cars, and there were two hooded men, or maybe teenagers, standing obnoxiously close to a woman sitting in one of the seats who was screaming for help. I suggested that we go over and kick their asses, but as me and a buddy got a closer look we saw they were armed with handguns. I pushed all my friends to get to the next car over away from the armed men. I took a look back and saw one of the men pointing at us before starting to follow. We ran through at least three different cars with the men following us. Before the train finally stopped at the next station, we all booked it through the old station to the nearest place we could hide. I got separated from my friends, so I went to hide behind a garbage can. I could hear my chaser's shoes hitting the tiled floors, so I knew I had no time to find a better hiding spot. I peeked through the opening at the top of the bin. I could get a better look at them now. One was black, the other was Indian, and they were both really young looking. I was sure they were only trying to rob us. Until I heard one of them say, if you find them, kill them. I hope you understand why I almost gave away my position in reaction to hearing this. With a gasp and almost pulling the garbage bin down with me as I returned to cover, I considered a miracle neither of them caught me. They left the area. I took notice that they didn't have their guns drawn at that moment. 
I ran in the opposite direction of the two and quickly caught my friends who were waving me over from behind a large pole. I took cover with them behind another pole not far from that one, and we waited for as long as we thought necessary. The big shock to this story, though, was when we caught glimpse of the woman from the train, who we thought was being threatened by the two men, walking over in the direction of the men, and then calling something along the lines of, where are they? Don't tell me you didn't get them. The two men reappeared from beyond a corner, walking over to the woman. The rest of what they said was too low to pick up on. They walked back down the stairs to the platforms, and as we could guess, waited for another train to run their trap again. At the very least, we called the police and reported what was going on, but I have no idea if they were ever caught. My name is Danny. I'm 22 years old and this was the most horrifying experience of my life. I live and work in New York City, but I don't have a car so my main mode of transportation is the subway. It was a Saturday night, I was on my way home from a party in the middle of the night. I did this about every other weekend so I was completely fine with taking the subway alone at night. It was always a bit chilling. This specific station was very tightly spaced. As I was walking, I could almost feel as if I were being watched or followed, along with the occasional echoing bang type sound emitting from an unknown location. I was early for the train, so I sat on a bench and waited. This is something straight out of a horror movie. I heard this exact phrase, Pussed, over here buddy. There was somebody standing on the tracks, inside the tunnel, poking his head out and looking at me. It was a filthy looking man. I'd seen his early 40s. He gave me a smile, a horrible yellow smile with at least three teeth missing, and I could tell that even from where I was sitting. I did the best I could to pay no attention to him, but he wouldn't go away. There was laughing coming from inside the tunnel, and then another disgusting looking man stuck his face out as well. This man gave me a nasty smile as well, before telling me to come hang out with him in the tunnel. The way they stared at me though, their eyes wouldn't even move. It's as if their sight was locked onto me. I resumed doing the best I could to ignore them and just wait for the train. I noticed in my peripheral vision that one of the men moved away into the tunnel, returning moments later with another face. I had to look again. There was a third face, but this one was hunched over and lifeless. It looked like one of the men were holding the guy's face up. The sound of the train approaching felt like a thousand pounds off my shoulders. I got up ready to board the train, but when I got closer to the edge of the platform, I nearly threw up at the sight. The two men were going back into the tunnel, but the second man in the back was holding something in his hand. A head. Just a head. Like a decapitated head. They disappeared from sight onto the side of the tunnel. As the train stopped, I got into the first car planning on warning the conductor, but no later than after we left the station. I didn't want to be there a second longer. As the train began to move, I saw legs moving down the stairs to the platform, but that was it. I didn't get to see who it was, but what I did get to see. As the train moved into the tunnels, I caught glimpse of a group of men, hunched up against the railing, inches away from the train window, and they were all looking right at me. I knocked on the conductor's door like a madman, screaming it was an emergency. He opened up and I explained what I just saw. He radioed to somebody in charge of the station, as well as another higher up of the company, who I'm sure took care of it, or contacted the proper authorities or security, whatever. It seemed to take ages for my stop to come. But when it did, I practically had to hop in my walk from relief. I have since been to one party at the same friend's house, but I skipped that station. I decided it was worth it to take the extra long walk to the next station. I don't know if weird shit happens often in the subway at night. In my experience prior to this incident, it never did. But after this experience, I think I should say you should be extremely cautious when in an isolated place, like a subway station late at night.
I used to work at my dad's restaurant when I was in my later teen years. It was just a regular local place, but was open until 2 a.m. every night. During high school, I would only work after school until 8. But once I graduated, I started working the closing shifts to save up money for college. The restaurant would be surprisingly busy at night, all the way up until closing. Mostly it was just people picking up online orders, but sometimes groups of friends would come in and hang out at one of the tables while they ate. I definitely preferred working at night though, as I would be the only one there and didn't have to listen to my dad bossing me around. Anyways, after six months of working nights, things started to get pretty weird. It was almost closing, around 1.45 a.m., and I was in the back cleaning when I heard the door ring. I finished up what I was doing and made my way to the front counter. There were two young men who looked really tired. One of them came up to the counter while the other one stood at one of the tables. Our dining room is closed for the night, but I can still take a small break. The man at the counter just stared at the menu and didn't say anything. I stood there uncomfortably as the man shifted his gaze to behind me as if he was inspecting the place. A few seconds later, the man by the table quickly walked out and the other guy followed. It was definitely the weirdest encounter I'd probably had and I couldn't really think of any reasonable explanation. I kind of just assumed that they were planning on robbing me but then decided otherwise for some reason. The next morning I told my dad about it, and he said I could start locking the doors at around 1.45 for the next few days. Another week went by with nothing unusual before it happened again. I had a customer picking up an order around 1.30, and almost as soon as he left, one of the men from last week walked in. It was the one that was standing at the table, and I noticed right away that he was wearing the same exact clothing as last time. However, this time he came up to the counter. He looked me in the eyes for a second, and then asked me if I could help him jumpstart his car. The way he said it was really creepy, and it was very obvious that there was something else going on here. Um, sorry. I have to stay in the restaurant during my shift. His face immediately shifted into a frown. He said it would only take a minute, and no one would know that I left. At this point, I knew something was very off and I started to panic a little bit in my head. He started making his way back to the door, gesturing me to follow him. I honestly wasn't sure what to do, and was really freaking out, but my fight response was starting, and my adrenaline was pumping. It's worth mentioning that I'm not really that big of a guy at all, and this man was much larger than me. Plus, I was pretty confident that the other guy was nearby too, probably ready to jump me if I didn't comply but I figured I was screwed either way, so I might as well try to fight. I grabbed a pair of scissors we had behind the counter and stood my ground. The man turned around again once he reached the door, and this time he looked angry and demanded that I followed him. At that same instant, a loud bang came from behind me, followed by the back door slamming open. I ran to the back and as soon as the guy saw me, he bolted right back outside. I turned around quickly and ran back to the front counter, but the other guy had left as well. I obviously called the police afterwards and gave them the security footage, but it was pretty low quality and hard to make out any identity from them. Anyways, I'm still not really sure why they didn't just attack me and rob the place, but my best guess is that they were just trying to rob the store without harming anyone. So as soon as they saw I was going to fight, they ran. Those two could have easily taken me down and made the situation much worse, so I'm glad it didn't turn out that way. I lived in a small apartment for most of my 20s, as it was all that I could afford since I lived alone. My complex was small, and only had six total apartments in it. Most of the people living there were older and retired and kept to themselves. I actually liked the fact that I didn't have to interact with any of them every time that I needed to go in or out of the complex, as I'm usually in a rush or just not in the mood to socialize. Anyways, I lived on the top floor, and the room across from me had an old couple living there for almost two years before they moved out. I never talked to them, so I didn't really care to be honest. But several months go by before someone new moves in, 
and another two weeks went by before I actually met them. I was getting ready for work one morning and preparing my packed lunch when I hear the neighbor's door open. I didn't think much of it until another minute went by and I realized that I never heard the door close. I finished getting ready and put my shoes on, then opened my door to leave. I immediately noticed that the neighbor's door was still open and a tall man in his 40s or 50s was standing right outside the door facing me. He smiled and introduced himself. I faked a short smile and told him my name, then said I had to go to work and began walking past him. But as I started down the stairs, he asked me to come in for a little bit and have breakfast with him. This was really weird as I had just told him that I needed to go to work, but I just said sorry and continued down the stairs and out of the complex. While I was at work that day, I thought about how strange the interaction was. Thankfully, when I got back home I was able to get into my apartment without any interactions, but the next morning I woke up to a knock at the front door. I was really annoyed because I had work today and now I was up early, but I quickly got dressed and opened the front door. My neighbor was there, but strangely he was standing right in front of his open door again. He asked me to join him for breakfast again, to which I obviously declined, and told him in a more aggressive manner to not knock on my door so early. The man didn't seem very happy about my answer and just kind of stood there. Then he said that I didn't have to leave for work for a while and I had enough time to eat with him. I knew that there was something wrong with this guy as there was a lot about that response that was creepy. I firmly said no and then backed away and closed my door, making sure to lock it. Creepy and disturbing the interactions seemed. The rest of the day went by as usual though, and I got home around 6. I made some dinner and watched a movie and got ready for bed around 11. I laid in bed for a while, thinking about my creepy neighbor and wondering what to do about it. I decided that if anything else happens I'd contact the owner of the complex and have him talk to the guy. Then I leaned over and turned off my lamp and tried to fall asleep. But a few minutes later, I heard the neighbor's door creak open. I waited silently, listening to what the guy was doing, but I couldn't hear anything else. Again though, I never heard the door close. I was pretty nervous, unsure of what the man could possibly be doing this late at night. Eventually, though, I drifted asleep due to not hearing any further noises for over an hour. I'm not sure how long I slept before a loud knock at the door woke me up, but these knocks didn't come from my front door. They were at my bedroom door. I shot up, completely terrified, and turned on the lights. The only thing I had to defend myself with was a small screwdriver on my nightstand. I grabbed it and stood next to my bed shaking in fear before picking up my phone and calling 911. When they arrived at the front door, I quickly got out of my room and opened it. I was surprised the door was even shut, but I told the officers everything and all about my suspicions of the neighbor. Unfortunately though, there was no real evidence of a break-in and they couldn't do much at all. I knew what I heard was real though, and I did not feel safe in my apartment anymore. I called my sister later that day, and she agreed to let me stay at her place for a few days. Those days went by quicker than I hoped though, and I started driving back to my apartment on Saturday evening. I tried to stay calm, assuring myself that the guy had given up by now, and everything would be okay. I pulled into the parking lot, and made my way into the building. The sun had just set so the staircase was dim. I slowly made my way up, trying to stay quiet as to not let my neighbor know that I was coming up. Once I reached the top, I saw his door was closed and I got a big sense of relief as I quickly made my way through my door and locked it behind me. I dropped my bag in the hallway and turned on the lights as I turned the corner into my living room. I jumped back screaming as the man was sitting right on my couch staring at me with a wide, awful smile. I sprinted out of the entire complex and into my car then called the police again and waited for them in a nearby parking lot. When they arrived about 10 minutes later, we drove up to the complex and they went into the apartment while I waited by my car. Surprisingly, they came out just a minute later with the man in handcuffs. They said he was still sitting on the couch and that they also found a small knife in his pocket. 
The most disturbing part of this whole situation, though, was that when he was questioned, he admitted to breaking in three separate times, and I only knew about the two incidents, which meant that at one point he was hiding in my apartment, probably watching me without me even knowing. I have a little Jack Russell dog named Maggie, and she has a lot of energy, so when we go for walks, it's not uncommon for them to spread to the two-hour mark. This particular day, I got home from work around 5.30, and the sun doesn't usually set until 6.30 or 7. Almost immediately after walking through the door, I put her leash on and quickly changed, and then we headed out. The walk went as usual as Maggie just took me in whichever direction she wanted to walk things didn't start to take a turn until about an hour in when the sun was almost fully down and unfortunately for me, I had walked further than I had realized. If you take your dog for long walks, you know how easy it is to zone out, especially if your dog rarely stops to sniff. We had walked in a direction I had taken normally, but the particular street I was on was unfamiliar but I still knew the general direction home. I started to turn around, but Maggie was standing still, and then she began whimpering softly, and that's when I saw it. Through the soft light of the sunset, I could make out a huge coyote staring at us in the middle of the street. It was roughly the size of a golden retriever with matted fur, and with its mouth partially opened, you could see its disgusting sharp yellow teeth. I knew exactly what it wanted, I picked Maggie up and started walking the opposite direction. I was a bit fearful, but for some reason I thought it would just go away. I didn't know these streets very well, but what I did know was that I had to keep moving. As I quickly continued, the coyote slowly followed, keeping its distance still. But the darker it got, the more scared I became. And after walking down random neighborhood roads in the darkness for a while, I came to the horrifying realization that I was lost. All the turns had messed with my sense of direction, and I had no idea which way to go. Through the darkness, I could now see the glowing eyes of the beast, and could now hear it yipping and howling. As I walked further through the dark neighborhood streets, every few minutes another set of glowing eyes would appear behind me, and even more, louder howls. I could tell they were getting closer too. I was absolutely terrified at this point, trying to hold back my tears as I was panicking and fearing for both mine and my dog's life. Every once in a while, I'd pass a street light and look behind me, revealing the entire pack walking slowly with their heads down, watching my every move. After almost 45 minutes of being followed, I began tiring and I knew I was far from the safety of my home. Maggie began whimpering louder too, which made me even more emotional as I knew that she was aware of what may soon happen. The howling and yipping became more frequent, growing louder and closer. I looked back one more time to see all of their eyes staring at me from only 30 to 40 feet away. But suddenly and strangely, they all began to separate, moving to the sides of the road. A few moments later, a small car slowly makes its way between the crowd of coyotes and stops right next to me. A lady rolls down her window and asked me if I needed help. I was so thankful for her and told her to please take me home. There are almost no circumstances in which I would willingly get into a stranger's car, but I really had no other choice. The lady was really nice and seemed terrified for me. I was crying at this point knowing I had just been moments away from a grueling attack. She kindly dropped me off at my house, which was almost 20 minutes from where she picked me up. I live in a nice neighborhood, one where you don't have to worry about your house being broken into or carjackings. The only growing problem in our neighborhood, and many neighboring ones as well, is coyotes. It's been a few years since this incident happened to me, and as time went on, there became more and more showing up around town, getting bigger and stronger. The public knows to be cautious, especially in parks where there are tons of trees and places for them to make home. Signs were put up letting people know of the popular areas where anywhere between 3 and 20 have been spotted. There have been news stories coming out, such as groups of coyotes leaping over fences and taking small dogs, 
and larger animals being found torn apart in kids' parks. Very sad stories, and some even a little scary. But you never think of coyotes as being in immediate danger until you're being followed in the middle of the night by a pack of the hungry. It was April of 2015. Me, my girlfriends, and my little brother, who was nine years old, had gone to a small nearby movie theater on a Wednesday night to see the horror movie It Follows. We usually went late on weekends to get the whole theater to ourselves, plus I had off on Thursdays that semester. When we entered the theater, at first it seemed like we were the only ones inside, but then my little brother pointed somebody out. It was a man in a dark gray hoodie sitting in the top left corner seat in the theater. It was a little sketchy, but nobody would really give it a second thought. We picked upper middle row seats with a railing in front so we could put our feet up, and we each sat with an empty seat between us for more room. I know, that sounds weird to do with my girlfriend with me, but having my brother there made it a different story. I was sitting the closest to the edge, and therefore the closest to the one other guy in the room besides us. Within five minutes, the previews were over and the movie was starting. The lights in the theater dimmed to darkness, and the only light now was the light projecting from the screen. My little brother took out his bag of candies he snuck in and started to eat them obnoxiously loud. About five minutes into the movie, over my brother's loud candy wrapper noises, which we told him to stop for the record, I thought I heard a pretty loud sound come from above and behind us. I waited a few seconds to sneak a glance behind us and saw that the guy that was sitting in the top corner had moved down a row, which was odd. But again, I didn't give it more than a second thought. Another five minutes later, when the movie was already starting to get interesting, I heard something from behind us again. I turned when I thought it wouldn't be too obvious, and again, the guy was a whole row closer to us. I leaned to my girlfriend and said while chuckling, don't look, but that guy keeps moving closer to the screen. She shrugged her shoulders and didn't even show interest in checking. I told myself if he did it again, then I would have a problem and managed to get back into the movie. I'd say another five minutes later, without even hearing anything this time. I just turned around out of curiosity and saw the man a whole row closer, but this time he wasn't at the last seat of the row anymore. He was moved further down the row, closer to us. Now he was only three rows behind us. I nudged my girlfriend and she turned around. Then she looked at me and gave me a confused, concerned kind of look. She asked me if we should move, and I said definitely not. At this point, I wasn't able to pay attention to the movie anymore. Even though I was facing the screen, I felt like the man's gaze was hitting me in the back of the head. I told myself if he moves closer, I would turn around and firmly ask him what he was doing. But then I also thought, what if I'm looking too much into this? What if he's just a normal guy who happens to keep switching seats for a better view? Once more, I turned around, and the man was only two rows away from us now, closer to the center of the row, or rather directly behind us, and his head was just completely down looking at his lap. I didn't even bother to check what he was looking at. He could have been looking at nothing. I literally opened my mouth ready to say something, but I was just too much of a coward. I was only 16 last year and pretty skinny. My little brother got up during a slow part of the movie to go to the bathroom. About a minute later, I turned to see if the man had gotten closer again, this time actually ready to say something, but I was shocked to see nobody behind us. It was completely empty. I told my girlfriend, and she said good, but then I stood up in pure fear, thinking of my little brother, telling my girlfriend to wait there and running out of the room and into the empty theater halls. I saw the man in the gray hoodie entering the men's bathroom down the hall. Fearing for my little brother's safety, I ran down the hall toward the bathroom, opened the door, and saw the man literally on his knees peeking under the two stall doors. Then he looked at me, and at the same time I heard my little brother call me from down the hall. I saw him waving me over in confusion. I ran to him got my girlfriend out of the movie room, and we went to the front desk. The teen working the front ticket stand called the police, showed us, and the cops the video footage of the man walking down the hall. 
and then we filed a police report. I'm just so grateful that my brother went to a different bathroom down the opposite direction of the hall, because if he had been in there, even with my showing up to save him, I have no idea what would have happened. It's been over a year now, and the man was never identified. Back in 2008, Cloverfield was one of the biggest movies of the year, and I desperately wanted to see it. Most of my friends had already gone to see it, which upset me given that I didn't want to be seen going to the movie theater alone. However, I didn't have work or school on Thursdays, so on Wednesday night I figured I could get away with going alone to one of the small theaters nearby with a screening of the film at 9.30, since I knew it would be quiet. Well, I showed up, bought a ticket, and immediately realized the entire building was dead. I entered the theater, and much to my surprise, there was not a single person in there. There were two large sections of seats in the theater. I sat in the bottom row of the upper section which was seated just behind a tiny wall. During the quiet parts of the movie, which were very few, I kept thinking that I was hearing something coming from behind me. It was almost like I was hearing a voice. Is someone there? Nothing. I felt like the sounds were just getting louder and closer, but I kept turning around and didn't see anyone. I felt like I was losing my mind. Eventually, the sounds became so loud that it was evident it was a crazed whispering. I was about to nope the fuck out of there, but when I got up and took one last look behind me, a figure popped up quickly from behind the seats, just two rows up from me, arms flat to their sides, and just facing me like a stiff statue. I ran like there was no tomorrow back to the lobby, where I saw nobody, not a single employee. I kept running to the car, took a few seconds to catch my breath once inside, and drove back home. I tried calling the theater that same night. I never got anyone to answer. I didn't bother the next day, and I just tried to let it go. It still freaks me out beyond imagination to this day. One of my first jobs was working at a movie theater in Huntington on Long Island. It was an okay gig for a 16-year-old. Dealing with the general public en masse, you'll always run into creeps. However, there was one creep and one really weird situation that I still have nightmares about. It was a Monday, like 11 o'clock at night, and the last two playing movies were finishing up, which was earlier than usual. On weeknights, I would usually be out of there by midnight during the summer. Anyway, I was the only one working besides Kathy, the lady behind the popcorn counter who was closing up. I was sitting on the carpeted steps next to my ticket podium on my phone when Kathy yelled over to me to sweep the floors. She told me she was heading out and would be back within the hour to close up. I hurried up with the sweeping and sat back down to get back to playing a Tetris-like game on my flip phone. I was left alone a lot like this, and this was the one time during my shifts that I feared something such as a late night robbery might easily take place. Suddenly I heard the front door to the theater pull open with force. I stared down at the doorway to the lobby which blocked the actual entrance section, waiting for someone to walk through and hoping it would be Kathy. After all, she would have locked the doors anyway at this hour. I called out Kathy's name, and suddenly, an upper middle-aged man with a big brown faded jacket came wandering in, immediately locking his eyes onto mine. I told him we were closing up and he had to leave. He looked at me with a sort of intimidating Vincent Pasteur kind of look on his face. He mumbled his words in his response, but I could make out his phrase to be, is Kathy here? I shook my head no, and he mumbled, I'm just gonna go sit down over there for a while. I was very against confrontations with other people, so my heart was racing and I lacked the confidence to order him to leave. I sat back down on the step and pretended to be absorbed in my phone, when really I was texting Kathy telling her there was someone weird here for her. But with the old flip phones, texts took forever to send and even longer for people to check. By the time the text was sent, I noticed the man, now across the room sitting on a bench, was literally watching me. 
I wanted to show him that I was annoyed by this, so I simply got up, walked up the three carpeted stairs, and sat down on the bench in front of a wall that would block my view from him. Stupid old me didn't figure this would allow him to do whatever he wanted not being within my vision. Within minutes I realized this was dumb and went back to sitting on the step, only now the man was gone. Kathy returned around the same time that the last of the moviegoers were leaving. I told her about the guy, and she said she left the door unlocked by mistake. I spent about 10 minutes sweeping up in some of the auditorium rooms before my shift was officially over. Kathy wanted me to do one more favor before leaving. Bring the mop, bucket, and broom down into the storage den. I did as she asked, opened the door in the lobby which leads to the storage area, walked down the half light of concrete stairs with the mop, broom, and bucket, and stopped. Behind one of the boilers, I could see as clear as day an arm tucked away in the corner. It was the man, and he was very clearly trying to hide. I pretended like I didn't notice and walked back up the stairs. I locked the door behind me and ran to Kathy. She checked the camera footage first, and this is where things got disturbing. Within the period of time that I was hiding from the man, the surveillance cameras caught him getting up and leaving the theater. Kathy seemed surprised and declared. I felt like my heart was starting to drop as she said this and I was starting to put things together. I assured her there was in fact somebody down there. She took out her cell phone and dialed not for 911, but rather for her ex-husband as she left the building. I followed her, afraid to stay in the theater alone. Kathy suddenly started to panic as it seemed her ex-husband hung up the phone on her. She then called the cops and what she explained to them shocked and disturbed me. When she hung up the phone she was in a panic and she tugged me away from the building. It turned out her ex-husband arrived to the theater to get her out of there because he had apparently run into some trouble with a guy he knew who threatened to kill Kathy for whatever messed up reason. The cop cars pulled up into the parking lot with their sirens blaring. Minutes later, they came out with some old Italian mobster looking guy in cuffs. Kathy never showed up for work after that and I was never able to get the full backstory out from anyone. I was the coolest guy at the theater for a while since I witnessed all of this. I just really wish I got the full story though, because it really interested me. I never saw Kathy, her ex-husband, or that random guy who potentially almost killed me had I approached him ever again. My mother and stepdad are ranchers. They got a new work truck and put the old one up for sale. A lady from another rural area about four hours away was super interested, but gave numerous reasons why she could not even drive halfway to get the truck. My stepdad is nice to a fault, so he convinced my mother to follow in a second vehicle that Saturday so he could drive the truck there. My mom's no fool, and this lady was already making her suspicious. Well. Her feelings weren't helped when we arrived, and the lady gave a convoluted story about bank problems and presented a post-dated check. She also begged my stepdad to leave the plates in his name. My mom excused herself, grabbed my stepdad, and had a heated argument about taking the check and the plates. She went on canceling the plates, but she lost on the check. So they drove another four hours home, and as anyone not my stepdad guessed, the check bounced when it came to the date it was written. The woman dodged phone calls for a while, eventually answering and giving another convoluted story about being in the hospital and on and on. My stepdad for once stood his ground and told her they'd be taking back the truck. So they drove another four hours there, this time with a flatbed in case parts were missing or something. No one answered the door at the property, and they found the truck in the shed and loaded it up. My stepdad had tried to keep my mom from saying what was on her mind, but while he was busy securing the load, she wrote something to the effect of, thanks for nothing, hope you enjoyed fucking us around, and slipped it under the door. Fifteen minutes later, as they're driving home, the cell phone rings, and the lady who was supposedly hospitalized was on the line. She said she knows exactly where they lived and that they made a huge mistake. Two days later, my stepdad awoke to someone climbing into the house through his bedroom window. 
I heard my mother's screams all the way from my bedroom, which was one of the most chilling moments of my life. It was the crazed woman breaking in, armed with a knife. I don't know how, but my stepdad managed to take her down even while she was armed. The whole story was shared with police, and then the woman was taken away. I guess karma is a pretty amazing thing. Let us know in the comments what you would do to prevent getting into such a situation. This story took place a long time ago, back in 2002, when Craigslist was in its early years. Many wouldn't know, but back in those days, Craigslist was a lot different. It was a lot more so an online garage sale, or just a place where people would list old things that still had some value that they were willing to give away. I got a basketball hoop, a hockey net, and a spoiler for my car all free and in perfect condition in that same year. You'd be lucky if you found something like that these days. Anyway, me and my son were dying to buy a hockey net so we could practice in the cul-de-sac we lived in. For the record, this was before I got that free one I mentioned. Wouldn't you know it, on Craigslist, there was an ad for a slightly used regulation-sized hockey goal for only $50. It came with a puck and two slightly used hockey sticks. I still have a picture of that ad to this day. It seemed like the perfect deal, but he lived about two hours away. I called the number he had listed, and he sounded pretty normal on the phone. He had a pretty deep dark voice, but nothing that would be off-putting. I remember his voice being a bit emotionless. He agreed to meet halfway due to the distance, said he'd put the stuff in the back of his pickup truck. He said he could only come after he got off from work though, which was much later in the day. We agreed to meet at some rest stop off the highway. Me and my son, who was 11 at the time, took my wife's minivan, the only car that would be able to fit that huge thing. Within an hour, we were at the truck stop, which was empty at this hour, but was decently lit by three big light posts. I parked right under one of the lights and waited. Pickup truck pulled in off the highway right on time. He stopped right in front of me. I went over to his window, but then noticed there was nothing in the back of his truck. You Steve? He asked me. Yup, that's me, I said. All right, my buddy's bringing in the stuff with his truck. The guy pulled up behind my car and put it in park. I suddenly had a bad feeling. I told my son to get back in the car and lock every door except mine. Two more pairs of headlights came off the highway into the lots, surely enough pulling up next to me. And, not surprisingly at this point, there was no hockey equipment in either one of them. My heart was racing, I was worried. Not for me, but for my young son who I for some reason brought with me on this trip. A group of large men mixed with heavy set and muscular physiques stepped out of the two pickup trucks behind the first one. They eyed me from head to toe, giving that typical intimidation stare down. Then this bald guy wearing sunglasses said in a deep voice, where's the money? I instantly pulled out my wallet and handed it to him, begging him to just let me and my son go. He pulled out like a hundred dollars and was pissed, expecting more. He then sent two of his guns or whatever to get my son. At this point I screamed and begged for him not to take him. One of the men broke the glass to the minivan back door, and I vividly remember the disturbing, heartbreaking screams of my young son. What happened next was what I can only explain to be a miracle from God answering my prayers. A car was entering the lot from off the highway. All the men stopped and turned to look at it. As it got closer, my heart literally dropped in excitement as I saw it was a police car. The lights suddenly began to flash as he got close enough to see what was going on. All of the men were back in their trucks within seconds, speeding off down the highway. Well, at least two of them. The truck in the back was caught immediately by the police car, and backup arrived shortly. I explained everything to them, and they got the men that were caught to rat out on the others surprisingly quickly. I guess luckily the guys in the back truck weren't very loyal to whoever their leader was. If they even had any type of leader, believe it or not, I had a police escort all the way home to make me and my son feel safer. I don't want to get into all the legal stuff, 
But I'll just say that all of those men except for one was caught, and I'm pretty sure that was the driver of the first pickup truck. Needless to say, my Craigslist days weren't over at that point, but I've always been much more protective of my son, and much more cautious of Craigslist meetings since then. Let us know in the comments what you would do to prevent getting into this position. I'm ashamed to admit that my life at one point was so pathetic that I had to resort to using the men seeking women and one night stand sections of Craigslist, specifically when I was 28. As you'd expect, most of the posts seemed fake or contained images of really fat, gross, or just undesirable women. That is, except for one. There was a posting with a picture of a cute brunette woman, saying on the listing, female 26, looking for a quick hookup. No feelings, no relationships, just one night stand. The thing about this photo was that it wasn't a picture of some insanely smoking hot chick. It was just a normal, decent looking woman making the whole thing more realistic and believable. She left her number on the bottom. I texted her and immediately noticed that she had an iPhone since my iMessage sent a blue bubble. Within seconds, the little gray bubble with the three periods popped up, informing me that she was typing. She replied with, Hi, I'm Jen, but you can call me Jenny. I started to kind of flirt around with her until she gave me her address. As I grabbed my car keys, I didn't know if I should feel excited or ashamed. Minutes later, I arrived to the relatively unlit dead-end block in a rather unappealing area. Second thoughts were popping up now. I shot her a text asking which house she was in. She responded 209, the last house by the dead end. I pulled up to the last house on the street, and sure enough the little porch light revealed the number 209 stamped onto the house. I'm not gonna lie, it was a shitty looking house. Tiny single floor, tall grass and whatnot. I was really doing this. The guy out of my car knocked on her door. There was no answer. Suddenly my phone vibrated. Jenny texted me, telling me to come around back. Why? I asked. The gray bubble indicating she was typing something popped up, then went away. I waited for her to type something, but she didn't. I was a desperate, pathetic man. So against my better judgment, I decided to go back to the house. I made my way over to the wooden gate and latched it open. I walked very slowly into the opening of the backyard and froze. I looked up at the windows of the dark house, and my heart skipped a beat when I saw someone staring down at me from one of the top windows. The moment they noticed me, they moved away and the blind closed. It must have been Jenny. I was thinking to myself. My phone vibrated. She texted me saying, I'll be right out, just brushing up. I was shaking now. I don't know if it was because I was nervous about hooking up with a woman for the first time in over a year, or if I was nervous about the weirdness of the situation. I could swear I suddenly heard a stick or something crack from further in the yard. Curiously, I flipped on the flashlight on my iPhone and aimed it over to that corner of the yard. My heart must have flat out stopped for a few moments when I saw what I could swear was an arm moving behind the wooden shed in the corner. I turned off the flashlight and somehow silently left the yard and got back in my car. Before I could shut the door, I heard a window from the house slam open, and a deranged, lunatic-sounding woman who I couldn't see screamed, Wait! Don't go! When I was pulling away from the house, the front door opened, and I heard a loud pop sound. I floored it away from there, and about five blocks up, I pulled over and realized I had a flat. They had shot my tire. I tried to get the car as far away from this town as possible before calling roadside service to set up my spare tire. The repair guy found the bullet still in the flat tire. He believed my story and did me a favor of vouching for me in front of a cop. There were three people who were arrested. One filthy looking woman and two redneck looking men. They stood trial and were found guilty of God knows what. I don't remember. It's funny. They were too stupid to even evacuate the house after pulling something like that. Please share in the comments how you would handle avoiding a situation like this.
When I was a kid, my parents would sometimes bring me down to my aunt and uncle's place to stay for the weekend. Mainly, I'd spend time playing with my two cousins, who were around the same age as me. They lived on a small farm with plenty of open space, and we could run around doing pretty much whatever we wanted. If we thought we could get away with it, the three of us would sometimes cross over to the neighboring farm about half a mile away. It had been abandoned for decades, with a scattering of derelict buildings and other structures still standing on the property, just begging to be explored. This was of course a gold mine for three adventurous young boys such as ourselves, especially after my cousins told me stories about the deaths that took place in the house. It was pretty classic fare. Man goes crazy, acts murders his entire family, hangs himself, returns every night as an angry spirit looking for new victims. Good, grisly stuff. Even at that age, I knew they were probably making it up, or at least embellishing old rumors. But seeing as how the setting lent itself so well to such tales, I allowed myself to buy into it. One afternoon, we decided to play hide and seek. When it was my turn to hide, I ran off for a flimsy brown barn that had living quarters on top and climbed the stairs looking for a good spot. There was still furniture inside, and personal belongings lay scattered across the floor. I maneuvered over broken dishes, tattered clothes, and crumbling books, eventually coming to a small room with a closet. Jackpot! There were even long black dresses still hanging on the rod that I could hide behind. I stepped inside and managed to force shut the folding door. My only illumination was a slit of sunlight that shone through the crack in the door from a nearby window. I crouched down with knees tucked into chest and waited. Some time passed, and there was still no sign of my seekers. I waited some more, debating if and when I should give myself up. After nearly an hour, this was starting to get boring. My head drooped. I awoke with a jerk. It was pitch black. I forgot for a minute where I was or what I had been doing. As it came back to me, the realization that it was now night time and that I had been abandoned here filled me with sinking dread in the pit of my stomach. I tried to get up, but a sudden cramp in my calf kept me grounded. I squirmed about, waiting for it to pass, when I heard a door slamming shut downstairs and instantly froze. One of my cousins? There was a brief period of silence, then footsteps at the bottom of the stairs. But not just footsteps, a thud too. After every other step, these weren't the footfalls of a child. They were slow, heavy, deliberate. I held my breath, praying they would go away. They did not. The noises continued to ascend. After another moment of silence, the walking resumed, this time along with a steady scraping sound, like something heavy being dragged across the floorboards. The footsteps made their way through the debris and wandered aimlessly through the various rooms. I thought I could smell something faintly putrid, the constant scrapes sent cold shivers coursing down my arms and back. My worst fears were realized when the steps reached the bedroom doorway. They got closer and closer, and finally stopped directly in front of the closet door. I couldn't see a thing. After an agonizing pause, they continued on, over to the other side of the room and out the doorway again. They faded away down the hallway. I waited for what seemed like an eternity. There were no more sounds now, and I was trying to build up enough courage to open the door and flee. Three things happened simultaneously just then. I was bombarded with a smell I can only describe as fresh roadkill. I heard raspy breathing behind me in the dark closet, and I felt hot breath against the nape of my neck. That was enough for me to hurdle myself out from the confines of that nightmare space relying on memory and scant moonlight to navigate through the darkened house. All the while, I heard footsteps chasing behind me, closing in with terrifying speed. It was a clumsy, torturous escape, full of trips and bumps and blind stumbling. I never looked back, at least, not until I had burst out the front door and into the country night. And when I did turn around, I saw absolutely nothing. There were no more footsteps and nobody was chasing me. 
That didn't stop me from running though. All the way back to my aunt and uncle's house. There was a police car in the driveway when I got back. My parents were there too, worried sick. Everybody demanded to know where I had been. Apparently when my cousins still hadn't found me by evening, they'd returned home to tell their parents. Eventually the police were called in and informed me that they had already scoured every building on the farm. The insinuation that I was lying about my whereabouts didn't go unnoticed. None of it made any sense. It wasn't until years later that one of my cousins filled in a final piece of the story. He and his brothers had spent hours searching for me like they said. But the part they didn't tell anyone was that they thought they spotted me in the window of the bedroom I was hiding in. And when they got closer, they saw that it wasn't me. A young boy neither of them recognized was smiling and waving down at them and gesturing for them to come upstairs. That's when they ran back home. All this while I slept in the closet. A few months ago, I was over at my friend's house down the block. In fact, that's where most of my friends on the block actually are. I'm 16 years old right now, the second oldest out of the group of kids down the block. There's Alan who's 17, Dan who's in the same grade as me but a little younger, Johnny who's 14, Daniela who's also 14, Nick who's 13, and Tom who's only 12 years old. There's a big age gap between some of us, but we're really the only kids on the entire me and Dan were the closest friends, and we kind of just met all the other kids who lived around the area while we hung out originally. It started to become our Friday night tradition to play a big game of manhunt by Daniela and Nick's house. We don't live in a typical suburban neighborhood. Our area is a lot more spacious and overall has a lot less people and houses. And for that reason, there wasn't a lot going on in our area, but it also made the game that much more fun. It was our turn to hide first. I had three other kids on my team, but more notably I had Dan on my team. Me and Dan both went next door to Mr. Nelson's old house. He was an old man who passed away a few years ago, and since then no one has bought the house, leaving it vacant and a perfect property to add space for our game. Me and Dan went to the back section of the property by the lake, where we found a perfect hiding spot in some of his bushes. Dan, however, wanted to try something crazy and entered the vacant house through a sliding window, so I waited alone in the bushes. The goal of the game was to get back to Nick's house, which was always considered home base. A big part of the game is waiting. I was in those bushes for like five minutes, until I finally saw two kids from the other team entering the backyard looking for us. They were making a lot of noise making their presence known. Once they left, the two of them continued even further down the block, giving us the perfect chance to run. I looked around at all the windows of the house hoping Dan would be standing near one of them for me to wave him on. And when I looked up to one of the upstairs windows, I was relieved to see his head looking down to me. I waved him on letting him know it's time to go, but he didn't move. Now I wasn't sure if he could see me. I went over to the window that he entered through, opened it, entered the house, and yelled up into the house calling Dan's name. I'm not even exaggerating when I say I felt like my heart stopped when I heard Dan's voice only a few feet away from me saying, Dude, sure. I asked him how he got downstairs so quickly, and he just looked confused. He then told me he was sitting down here this whole time. At that same moment, we both looked up to the ceiling as there was a creaking sound coming from upstairs. We both hopped back out the window and ran back to Nick's house, where we called the game off. We want to ask Dan's dad if somebody had moved into the home, but he was positive that nobody had lived there for three years. Me, Alan, Dan, and Dan's dad all went over to the house where we entered the same way we had earlier. Dan's dad was familiar with the house, as he used to be good friends with Mr. Nelson. He led the way upstairs into the bathroom with a window I had seen someone standing at. He flicked on the lights, and besides a crumpled up reddish brown blanket on the floor, the room was empty. We went through the entire house and found nothing. Dan's dad really didn't know what to do from there. So he just said if any of us, including him, ever see anything or anyone in that house, 
We would report it to the police immediately. It's been a few months already and we haven't seen anything since. But I know that somebody, besides Dan, was in that house that night. My girlfriend and I always enjoyed going for weekend camping trips pretty frequently. We used to live right inside the Appalachian region in Virginia. So obviously we'd find new places on or near the Appalachian Mountains. Both of us had pretty stressful work lives during the weekdays. So getting out in nature and staying away from home on the weekends really helped us. At the time this happened, we had already been on dozens of camping trips in the Appalachian Mountains, but none of them had ever ended like this. It was Saturday morning, and we decided on a very small three-mile trail that leads to a nice, isolated camping ground on a flatter part of the mountain. We had never been to the specific spot before, but from the amount of reviews the trail had on Google, we assumed it was a pretty well-known trail and campgrounds. We got our bags ready and packed the truck with our camping gear, and then we made our way out there. It was only a 45-minute drive from our house, but as we got closer it began raining quite a bit. This was pretty normal around the mountains here, so we were used to being out in the rain and it didn't bother us enough to turn around. We pulled up to the trailhead, which was actually just off the side of the road, and we saw one other car parked on the side. We actually expected there to be more people considering the popularity of the trail, but we were glad it wasn't crowded though as we started getting our gear out. My girlfriend pointed out that the parked car's passenger door was cracked open a few inches. We both looked around to see if the owner was nearby, but with no signs of them I decided to go over and push it closed as we assumed the owner must have accidentally left it open. The whole passenger seat was soaked from the rain already, but at least it wouldn't get any worse. I came back to our car to grab my stuff, and then we both started making our way down the trail. We talked about how weird it was that the door was open and how most people would probably notice that their car wouldn't even lock due to the open door. It's worth mentioning too that it was clearly a pretty expensive newer car which just made him more strange. Anyways, the rain started picking up at this point, so we began walking faster so we could get to the campsite and set up our tent. I want to say it took us about two hours to get to the end as it was mostly up. Still, once we were there, the first thing we noticed was a tent already set up in the middle of the flat area. It was pretty small, definitely a one-person tent. We figured they were probably in there, sheltering from the rain. So we went to a far corner on the site and set up our tent there. We sat inside for an hour, eating some food we brought, and laying some of our stuff out to dry before hearing voices outside. The rain hitting the tent was too loud to hear what they were saying. So I unzipped the front and looked out. I jumped a little bit as there were two men kneeling down and looking at us from just a couple of feet away. But then they smiled and introduced themselves. They said they were staying in the tent in the middle and that they'd been here a few days. I quickly introduced my girlfriend and I and told them that we were just here for the night. Then they headed back and I zipped up our tent and looked at my girlfriend. The whole interaction seemed a little off and they seemed to be acting a little strange. I noticed that both of the men were wearing tightly fitted jeans and regular t-shirts, and their tent was way too small to be fitting two full-grown men. It really just didn't seem like they were here camping or hiking, and definitely not for a few days like they had said. We decided to leave the zipper partially open, so we can keep an eye on them just in case. Another hour went by, and we didn't see anything unusual. Actually, we didn't see anything at all. I guess they were just cramped up in their tent the whole time. Anyways, it was pretty dark out at this point. So we decided to call it a night and get our sleeping bags ready. I zipped the tent back up and lay down next to my girlfriend. I must have fallen asleep pretty fast, though, because I didn't even remember anything after laying down. But I woke up a few hours into the night having used the bathroom. It was still raining. So I put on one of my cheap plastic rain ponchos so that I wouldn't have to go back to bed. I headed out a few feet behind her tent and behind one of the trees. But through the rain, I could hear voices. It was really hard to tell where they were coming from, though I turned my head all around, looking in every direction as I started to get a little paranoid. But I didn't see anyone, and I looked over at the small tent in the middle and noticed the front zipper was open. 
It was hard to see in the darkness and through the rain, but I was pretty sure that nobody was in there. I knew that the men had told me that they were staying the night in the tent, so they started to get me even more worried. I ran over to my tent and shook my girlfriend awake and told her about the situation. She was clearly tired, but I could tell that she was just as worried as I was. As we were discussing what to do, we both heard it. Voices coming from behind our tent. I wasn't sure what to do, but I knew sitting in the tent didn't feel very safe anymore. I told my girlfriend to pack the bags quickly and be ready to leave if we had to. Then I grabbed a small pocket knife and quickly got out and looked over at the trees. I saw the two men from earlier standing there, just a few feet from our tent. I remember this moment very clearly as both men looked at me with absolutely no emotion. They didn't make any facial expressions or even move at all. I knew at that moment that these men were planning on doing something horrible and they were not scared of me at all. A second later, my girlfriend looked out of the tent, which took me out of my state of shock, and I yelled at her to go pointing at the trail back down the mountain. I followed after her leaving my bag in the tent behind. I looked back just as we made it to the edge of the campsite, and the two men were still standing there. They didn't even try to chase us or anything. They just stood and watched us as we ran away in total fear. I'd say we were full-on sprinting for 10 minutes before slowing down and walking quickly for the rest of the way. When we got back to the car, we saw the other parked car was still there, but the passenger door was opened again. I immediately drove us down to the nearest gas station where we called the police and were met by them. A few minutes later to talk about what had happened. A few days passed by, and then we get a lot more information and it made everything even more terrifying. When an officer went down to investigate the area, they found that the car belonged to an older man who had recently been filed as missing. I was lucky enough to have a job that allowed me to travel a lot in my late 20s and early 30s. I would usually only spend a couple of days in one location for work, so I was limited in how much I could actually do when I was staying somewhere nice. But I had a job out in Pennsylvania for a week and ended up finishing a day early, which meant I'd still have to stay there for an extra day before my flight. Since I never got to get out much, I figured I should use this time to my advantage and do something fun. I decided on a long trail that went through some pretty forests and trees here. I've always enjoyed nature, but I felt like my job forced me to be inside buildings or planes all the time. So this was a good chance for me to enjoy the nice weather and scenery. I woke up early but actually had to go to the store to buy some hiking clothes, as I didn't pack any with me. The trail was about an hour away from my hotel, and I ended up getting there just before 12 p.m. It didn't look like anyone else was there, which I was pretty happy about. When I looked up the trail online, it said it would take about six hours there and back, so this was pretty much an all-day thing. I had a little backpack with a water bottle and some snacks, so I brought that and started making my way down. The first hour was really nice. Just being alone on a path between the trees was peaceful and a nice way to get some relief from my stressful work life. But as I was walking, I noticed a man sitting on the ground next to the path up ahead. He looked almost as though he were sleeping, with his head hanging down and a hoodie covering his face. As I started to get closer, he looked up at me, almost staring me down as I walked past him. I had no idea what to make of him, but it was a little creepy, so I continued to check behind me occasionally for the next few minutes as I continued down the trail. After a couple of hours, I got a little tired and hungry, so I found a small log on the edge of the path and sat down to have a snack. I was probably there for three or four minutes before the man that I'd walked past earlier appeared down the path making his way towards me. He was still a good distance away, though, so I decided to quickly pack my bag up and continue down the trail so I didn't have to interact with him. Apparently, my plan didn't work, though, as only a few minutes later, I heard loud running footsteps coming up behind me. I turned around and saw the man jogging in my direction. I moved over to the side, hoping he would just pass by, but he ended up stopping right in front of me. I'll admit I was pretty nervous and felt really uneasy about this guy. 
He didn't say anything and reached into his pocket, then held out a wallet and said, I think you dropped this. The wallet definitely wasn't mine, though, and I could tell it was completely empty too. I told him that he must be mistaken and that I didn't bring my wallet with me. He responded, telling me that he knew this was my wallet and I needed to take it back. I honestly didn't know what to do or say, but I could see in his eyes that he was getting mad. I was pretty sure this guy was trying to pull some weird trick to rob me or something, but I didn't know what other options I had other than to just listen to the guy. So, I just said okay and picked up the wallet from his hand. Then he looked me in the eyes, smiled, and said, you're welcome, before making his way down the trail. I stood there for a minute, processing the interaction I just had. Then I held out the wallet and looked at it more closely. It was one of those typical brown folding wallets and looked pretty worn and old. I opened it up and checked every pocket in it, but there wasn't a single thing in there. I was so confused. I had no idea what to think, but I knew I didn't want to run into this man again. So I just started making my way back to my car. It was 4 p.m. now, and I had a little over two hours to go before getting back to my car. I tried my best to enjoy the walk, but I couldn't stop thinking about what happened, and it kept making me more and more nervous. I was constantly looking around to make sure he wasn't following me, but finally, I could see my car up ahead. The sun was just beginning to set, casting a long shadow on everything, and my car was parked facing the trail, so I was walking towards the front of it. Once I was a few feet away, that's when I noticed a man's shadow coming from behind the car as if he were crouched down. I stopped in my tracks, staring at his shadow next to my car. I knew that running away would almost surely end badly, but I also knew that he was probably going to try and steal my car and rob me once I tried to get inside. After a few seconds, I quietly reached into my pocket to feel for my keys, then started walking towards the passenger door. I quickly unlocked the car and got in through the passenger side. I could hear the man instantly jump up and run straight for the driver's side door, but I locked it from the inside just before he tried to open it. He started banging on the window as I crawled into the driver's seat and turned on the car. I could clearly see it was the same man from earlier, and he began screaming at me to give him the wallet back. I ignored him and reversed out of there and onto the main road where I drove away as quickly as I could. As I was pulling away, he ran back onto the path and into the trees. I guess my plan had worked, assuming it threw him off by not going to the driver's side door and gave me time to get in and lock it. There was a police station I remembered seeing on the way. So I stopped there and went inside to report the man and give them the wallet, and then I headed back to the hotel. I called one of my friends to tell them about it that night, as it was just such a crazy situation. It's pretty obvious he was either trying to rob me or steal my car, but I find myself still questioning what the purpose of the wallet was as it didn't seem to have any real significance anyways. I'm just happy that I was able to make it out safely and without losing anything. I always carry a small pocket knife with me whenever I go for walks. You never know what crazy situations you can find yourself in. It was near the end of October last year, which always makes for the best hiking weather as it's not too hot and not too cold. I had a group of friends that I'd go hiking with a lot, but most of them had jobs with no set schedules, which would make it hard to find days where we could often go for some shorter hikes alone and just enjoy the peace and quiet. I had the weekend off, so I found a nice hiking and camping trail nearby and drove up there on Saturday morning. I had actually been on this trail a couple of years before and had always wanted to go back. It was a loop trail, so it basically went into a big circle from the start and was around a day and a half long. I parked my car in a small gravel parking lot and made my way up to the trailhead. The first few miles were flat and mainly just went through grassy fields before eventually leading into a forest at the bottom of a small mountain. At this point, it was probably midday and I was well into the forest when I saw a man walking up ahead. He was too far for me to tell at first if he was walking towards or away from me, but as I continued forward, I realized he was walking towards me. This wasn't a very popular trail, and the last time I hiked it, 
I don't think I saw anyone, but it was the weekend and I figured maybe he just had the same idea as me. As he got closer though, I noticed he didn't have a backpack on, and this was pretty unusual as I was probably six or seven hours down the trail, and there was no way someone would go this far without even a water bottle. He waved at me once. He's a few feet ahead. I returned the gesture to be polite, but still being cautious due to being in such an isolated area. As he passed, I heard his footsteps stop and the dirt crumble, as if he turned around. I looked back, and sure enough, he's facing me. And then he asks me something really strange. Where's your group at? I wasn't sure how to respond as all I could really think about was whether this stranger knew that I usually had a group, or if he was just trying to figure out that I was alone. Either way, it was unsettling and made me really nervous. I responded, telling him that they were on their way a couple of minutes behind me. I couldn't think of anything else to say, but I definitely didn't want this man to think that I was alone. Good, he replied, then smiled and began walking again. I continued on in the opposite direction, further down the trail. A few hours went by, and I spent most of the time thinking about that guy and how weird the whole situation was. The fact that he didn't have a backpack so deep into the hike made the whole thing even more unsettling. I decided I'd find a good place, a little ways off the main trail, to set up my campgrounds just to be safe. I found a nice flat area about a half mile from the trail and pitched my small tent. The sun was starting to set, so I sat outside my tent and just tried to stop thinking about the guy. I had a pre-packed lunch made for the trip, so I got that out and finished it before lying in the tent to try and get some sleep. I was lying there for probably over an hour, unable to sleep, before I started to hear footsteps coming from the trees behind my tent. I froze listening to them moving towards me. I tried to reason with myself in my head that it was probably just some animal or something, but the steps were all too recognizable as a person's. It sounded like they were 15 to 20 feet away when they suddenly stopped. I waited there for what felt like hours, laying still and listening intently with my heart racing. But there were no more footsteps. I knew they had to be waiting nearby, as I would have heard the footsteps fade out if they had left. Eventually, more hours had passed, and the sun was just starting to rise. I knew I had to get out of here at some point, and I was so tired that I was questioning if maybe I'd somehow just not heard the footsteps going away. I unzipped the tent and lifted the flap up a little to peek outside, but I didn't see anything, so I got out and looked around. It was very quiet, and the trees were blocking most of my view, but from what I could see, nobody was there. After a few minutes, I cautiously packed up my tent, still looking around frequently as I was definitely on edge, and every small noise would make me jump. I attached my tent to my bag and started heading back towards the trail as quickly as I could, but I only made it a few steps before noticing clear footprints in the dirt just behind a tree that was right by where I had my tent. I began panicking and didn't even look for any more footsteps as I sprinted towards the trail. I was terrified now, as I knew there was someone stalking me in the middle of an isolated forest, hours away from anywhere safe. Once I got back to the path, I quickly began walking back down the way I came. It was probably quicker at this point just to continue down, but I figured that whoever was watching me would probably be waiting for me to continue that way. Luckily. Nothing else happened the whole way back to my car, which I didn't get to until nearly sunset. I told my friends about the strange man and what I heard and saw, and they all said that I was lucky to get out of there without anything else happening. I contacted the police just to report the suspicious activity on the trail, but not much was able to get done about it. I'm definitely more cautious when hiking and camping now, and I rarely go without my group of friends anymore. I will never know what that guy's true intentions were, and I hope nobody else has to know either. Being a delivery driver for several pizza places a few years back, I had a lot of experiences with weird customers or just strange things that would happen at night. But this one night takes the prize for the most disturbing and unusual situation. 
I had been working at the specific chain pizza shop for just under a year. I worked mid shifts and night shifts alongside one other coworker for the most part. It would stay busy basically up until closing at 2 a.m. so there wasn't a ton of time to mess around, especially since it was just the two of us. I'll call my coworker Tom to keep his privacy. Tom was older than me by a few years and was a quiet, hard worker. He was in charge during the night shifts and would make all the pizzas while I would deliver them. Both of us would answer calls, though, depending on who was busy and who wasn't. Anyway, it was just past 11 p.m. and I had gotten back from a delivery when the phone rang. Seeing Tom in the middle of making a pizza, I picked up the phone. A man on the other line spoke, asking for a large sausage pizza. I put in the order and asked if he needed anything else. The man didn't answer for a moment. Then he repeated himself, saying that he'd like a large sausage pizza. This time I could tell through the way he mumbled it out that he was likely drunk. I confirmed that he just wanted one pizza and the man said yes. I sent the order through, then grabbed my next delivery and dropped it off. Getting back to the shop, Tom had finished the guy's order and prepped it for delivery so I grabbed it off the counter, ran to my car. I noticed as I was grabbing the order though Tom was giving me a weird look as if he wanted to say something to me but he decided not to. Again though, Tom was pretty quiet and soft-spoken so it wasn't very odd. The address was a good 15 minutes away but there was no traffic at this time so I got there pretty early. The house was normal but had a lot of land on either side with the neighbor's homes barely visible through the trees. I got out and went around to the passenger door to pick up the pizza. Then I headed up to the porch and knocked on the door. A few seconds later, a man came and opened the door wide open. This wasn't all that strange, but I always found it odd when people would open their door that wide as it was just unnecessary, but his face when he saw me seemed very confused and surprised as if he hadn't expected to see me. Figuring he was just drunk and out of it, I handed him the box and told him his total, to which he slowly and awkwardly handed me cash not saying anything. He held the box of pizza while standing in front of me and looked at it with a strange intensity. Then he moved his eyes up towards me, but not at me. He was looking over my shoulder like he saw something but was just staring at it with that same intensity before shaking his head slowly like he was saying no. Getting really uncomfortable watching this man, I couldn't help but look back. I turned my head over my right shoulder and looked toward the driveway. Just a few feet from my car was a hooded man running back towards the trees. My heart jumped and I felt my body go into a sort of shock trying to figure out what to do. I turned back around to face the man at the door, but he immediately stepped back and slammed the door shut. It all happened so fast in just a matter of seconds and gave me no time to react. With the door closed in front of me, I turned to face the hooded man again, but he was lost in the dark tree line. I stumbled off the porch and ran to my car, backing out of the driveway as soon as possible and driving back to work. I called myself during the drive but still couldn't understand what happened. When I got back, I told Tom about the encounter, who seemed to have very little reaction and rather just told me to deliver the next order when I was ready. I did as he said, but on my way back from the delivery, I ended up pulling over and calling the police to let them know just in case. They said they would have an officer check it out and call me back to update me. I got a call an hour later, and once I got out of work, I waited in the parking lot for the police to show up and talk to me. When the officer came up to my car, he mentioned that he talked to the man at the residence who matched the description I gave him, and the guy told the officer that he was just waiting for his buddy Tom to show up since he knew he worked at the pizza shop. When asked about the hooded man, he gave no details, saying he didn't know anything about that and he didn't see any. With that information, I was even more horrified and confused. I thought maybe they called thinking Tom was a delivery driver and were setting him up so that they could jump him. That would explain the hooded man by my car and the surprise of the guy at the door. I also think back to that look Tom gave me thinking maybe he was going to warn me of something. I talked to Tom on multiple occasions about it, but he gave me quick useless answers saying the guy was just an old friend and that he didn't know anything about anything. I moved on to another pizza shop very soon after that incident. But now that the horror of the situation is in the past and I know it likely wasn't a target on me specifically, I enjoy trying to figure out the mystery. I still don't know for sure what the situation was, but it was by far the strangest and creepiest I've ever had. I had been working at a specific chain pizza shop for just under a year. I worked mid shifts and night shifts alongside one other coworker for the most part. It would stay busy basically up until closing at 2 a.m. so there wasn't a ton of time to mess around, especially since it was just the two of us. I'll call my coworker Tom to keep his privacy. Tom was older than me by a few years and was a quiet, hard worker. 
He was in charge during the night shifts and would make all the pizzas while I would deliver them. Both of us would answer calls, though, depending on who was busy and who wasn't. Anyway, it was just past 11 p.m. and I had gotten back from a delivery when the phone rang. Seeing Tom in the middle of making a pizza, I picked up the phone. A man on the other line spoke, asking for a large sausage pizza. I put in the order and asked if he needed anything else. The man didn't answer for a moment. Then he repeated himself, saying that he'd like a large sausage pizza. This time I could tell through the way he mumbled it out that he was likely drunk. I confirmed that he just wanted one pizza and the man said yes. I sent the order through then grabbed my next delivery and dropped it off. Getting back to the shop, Tom had finished the guy's order and prepped it for delivery so I grabbed it off the counter, ran to my car. I noticed as I was grabbing the order though Tom was giving me a weird look as if he wanted to say something to me but he decided not to. Again though, Tom was pretty quiet and soft-spoken so it wasn't very odd. The address was a good 15 minutes away but there was no traffic at this time so I got there pretty early. The house was normal but had a lot of land on either side with the neighbors' homes barely visible through the trees. I got out and went around to the passenger door to pick up the pizza. Then I headed up to the porch and knocked on the door. A few seconds later, a man came and opened the door wide open. This wasn't all that strange, but I always found it odd when people would open their door that wide as it was just unnecessary, but his face when he saw me seemed very confused and surprised as if he hadn't expected to see me. Figuring he was just drunk and out of it, I handed him the box and told him his total, to which he slowly and awkwardly handed me cash not saying anything. He held the box of pizza while standing in front of me and looked at it with a strange intensity. Then he moved his eyes up towards me, but not at me. He was looking over my shoulder like he saw something but was just staring at it with that same intensity before shaking his head slowly like he was saying no. Getting really uncomfortable watching this man, I couldn't help but look back. I turned my head over my right shoulder and looked toward the driveway. Just a few feet from my car was a hooded man running back towards the trees. My heart jumped and I felt my body go into a sort of shock trying to figure out what to do. I turned back around to face the man at the door, but he immediately stepped back and slammed the door shut. It all happened so fast in just a matter of seconds and gave me no time to react. With the door closed in front of me, I turned to face the hooded man again, but he was lost in the dark tree line. I stumbled off the porch and ran to my car, backing out of the driveway as soon as possible and driving back to work. I called myself during the drive but still couldn't understand what happened. When I got back, I told Tom about the encounter, who seemed to have very little reaction and rather just told me to deliver the next order when I was ready. I did as he said, but on my way back from the delivery, I ended up pulling over and calling the police to let them know just in case. They said they would have an officer check it out and call me back to update me. I got a call an hour later, and once I got out of work, I waited in the parking lot for the police to show up and talk to me. When the officer came up to my car, he mentioned that he talked to the man at the residence who matched the description I gave him, and the guy told the officer that he was just waiting for his buddy Tom to show up since he knew he worked at the pizza shop. When asked about the hooded man, he gave no details, saying he didn't know anything about that and he didn't see any. With that information, I was even more horrified and confused. I thought maybe they called thinking Tom was a delivery driver and were setting him up so that they could jump him. That would explain the hooded man by my car and the surprise of the guy at the door. I also think back to that look Tom gave me thinking maybe he was going to warn me of something. I talked to Tom on multiple occasions about it, but he gave me quick useless answers saying the guy was just an old friend and that he didn't know anything about anything. I moved on to another pizza shop very soon after that incident. But now that the horror of the situation is in the past and I know it likely wasn't a target on me specifically, I enjoy trying to figure out the mystery. I still don't know for sure what the situation was, but it was by far the strangest and creepiest I've ever had. During COVID, delivering groceries became pretty popular, and even after, people still had them delivered to their house. I was a picker for those orders and when we were understaffed, which was pretty much all the time, I was also dropping them off. It wasn't a bad job. I actually enjoyed driving to people's homes. I got to see nice houses and I didn't have to deal with the constant questions from customers, so I wasn't complaining. I got tipped sometimes too, which was nice. Most of the time, though, I left the groceries at the doorstep, took a picture as proof, and then left. But I did have moments where I got to meet the people and help them take in the groceries. One instance was this older lady from Serbia. Her name was Vesna and she loved me. 
We got to know each other because every Thursday she'd have pretty much the same stuff ordered to her house at the exact same time. The first few times I dropped off her groceries, she never came outside, but I'd catch her peeking out the window at me. I'd give a little wave, take my picture, then get back in the truck and leave. I think when she realized it was the same person delivering her groceries every time, she got more comfortable, she came out and greeted me. Then slowly, over time, I started bringing in the groceries for her and setting them on her counters. She was pretty old, so I was happy to help and she also tipped nicely too. The more I went, the more I got to know her. She was recently widowed and lived alone. All her children lived far away and she only saw them once or twice a year for the holidays when she could take the train. She was also retired, but she used to be a broker, which explained her nice house. I always looked forward to Thursdays, and this one was no different. She had ordered everything on Monday, as she always did, and I was dropping off the following Thursday. When I pulled into the driveway, I immediately noticed that something was off. She wasn't at the door like she usually was, but the door was open. I also noticed that all her blinds were closed, which was strange. She always kept them open so her plants could get some sun. I went up to the open front door and not seeing her, I rang the doorbell. I waited for a bit, but there was no answer. I knocked a few times and there was no answer again, so I naturally started to become a little worried. She was old, so my immediate thought was maybe she fell or had a heart attack or something. I kind of stood there wondering what I should do. I thought maybe I should go inside, but I was also on the job and I know the rules are that if no one answers, I just have to leave the groceries on the porch. Being her friend though, I decided it was best to go inside and at least put her groceries on the counter like usual, the door was open after all. I grabbed all the bags in both my hands and walked straight into the kitchen. All the lights were off and everything was quiet. Placing the bags on her counter, I called out her name again, hearing no response. As I started walking out, calling the police crossed my mind, but I didn't really know how to explain. This was an emergency because what if she was just out of the house? Maybe she was just visiting someone and I just wasted the police officer's time. I really was in a weird position, but I just knew something was wrong. Just as I got to the doorway leading outside, I heard movement in the house upstairs. I felt relieved for a moment, calling out for Vesna, but then there was again no response. No one came to the door or answered me. After a minute of standing there, I kept hearing shuffling movement as if someone was moving stuff around upstairs and started to feel really awkward and uncomfortable. I headed back outside and got in the car. I sat there for a little while and after a minute I saw the curtains on the second story move to the side as if someone was looking at me through the window. I pulled out and drove around the corner then parked on the street and sat there, just really confused. I didn't know if it was her and she just didn't want to see anyone or maybe one of her kids. I was also concerned with whether or not I should call the police. I drove off, went around the block and then decided to drive by her house again. I sat there for a little while again until I saw the upstairs curtains open. I saw a male figure look out and then close it quickly as if seeing my truck scared him. I knew Vesna had two daughters and she had a son, but he had passed away years ago so I'm not sure who could possibly be at her house. With her not there. And where would she be anyway? I had been there too long though and had to get back to work. The following week, there were no orders from her for the first time in almost a year. I drove by her house after I got off on Thursday and in the driveway was an officer's car. When I got home, I searched her name and found that she had been filed as missing only a few days after I had been there to deliver her groceries. I noticed the date they said she was likely last at home, though, was the day after she had ordered the groceries two days before I had gone to her house and saw that man. I went to the police with all the information I had. I don't know who that man was or if I was close to having something happen to me as well, but it's been nearly three years now and there have been no updates.